Unit 1. And our next caller is Karen. Karen, what's your experience of public transport? Yes, hello, Gary. Well, I commuted to London for over ten years. I caught the train every morning at 7.15 to get to work for nine o'clock. And I wouldn't get home until about seven o'clock in the evening. And frankly, it was a terrible period of my life. Really stressful. Mainly because of the unreliability of the train service. I was forever arriving late for work. One day, I was travelling home when the train broke down and I eventually got back at midnight. Of course, I had to go to work the next day, so off I went for my 7.15 train. I'd been waiting over an hour when they announced that the train was cancelled. That really was the end for me. I arranged with my employer to work at home and I've been working at home happily for the last five years. Of course, it meant a big salary cut, but I haven't regretted it for a moment. Thanks for that, Karen. Can you just stay on the line? I'm hoping we've got Liam on the line. Liam, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Gary. Great. And what point do you want to make? Well, I just wanted to say that my experience is similar to your last caller. Although I'm a newcomer to commuting by public transport, I've just sold my car and now I go to work by bus. I'd owned a car ever since I left college, but I wanted to do my bit to cut down on pollution. But I have to confess that I'm regretting it already. I've arrived late for work twice this week because the bus hasn't turned up on time. It's got so bad that I'm now thinking of buying a motorbike. It'll cause less pollution than a car and be more reliable than public transport. Well, it sounds like you're another dissatisfied customer, Liam. But we've also got Sahar on the line, and I think she's more positive. Sahar, are you there? I am, Gary. Good afternoon. Hello, Sahar. What do you want to tell us? Well... I'd like to put in a good word for train travel. I'm working at home while our office block is being renovated, and while I'm appreciating being able to get up later than usual, I really miss my daily commute. You get to know the people you travel with every day. I remember one day I dropped my purse while I was getting off the train. Another passenger picked it up, found my address in it, and brought it round to my house later that evening. Another time, I'd been working really hard and went to sleep and missed my station. One of the other passengers was getting off at the next station and she had her car parked there. She woke me up and offered me a lift back to my home. I'd spoken to her only a couple of times before then, but now she's a really good friend. You meet a lot of nice people and become a part of the travelling community. Thanks, Saha. That's a side of commuting we don't often hear about. Now, somebody else who sees the good side of train journeys. Luca, are you there, Luca? Yes, indeed. Actually, I'm phoning from the train on my way home from work. And are you having a good journey? Yes, it's been fine. But then, I love trains. I've enjoyed travelling by train ever since I was young. I admit that it can be frustrating at times. There are delays and cancellations, and there are minor irritations like poor mobile phone reception. I've been trying to phone into your programme for the last half hour, in fact. But I catch the 7.05 at the station near my home every morning, and still find there's something quite magical about stepping onto the train. And there are clear advantages over driving, apart from the lack of stress. I reckon that over the years I've saved a huge amount of money by using public transport. I've never really considered buying a car... You can also get a lot of work done. On the train yesterday morning, for example, I'd read a couple of reports and prepared for an important meeting before I even got to work. Admittedly, I'm quite lucky. The train company I travel with have invested a lot of money recently. They've bought new trains and have really improved the service. Gary? Karen, were you wanting to say something? Yes, I just wanted to pick up Luca's point that travelling by train is less stressful than driving. Public transport can be stressful too when trains don't turn up or are delayed. What's less stressful is working at home. At 8 o'clock I'm usually having a leisurely breakfast when most people are in their cars or on the train. Yesterday I'd finished all my work by 2.30 so I drove to the local pool for a swim. And today I've been working hard all day so now I've got time to relax by listening to the radio for a while. Much better than the stress of commuting. You're very lucky, Karen. We've got another caller on the line. Unit 2 You must be really looking forward to going to America. When are you actually leaving? I'm flying on the 15th of July. I'm spending a few days sightseeing in New York, and then I arrive in Los Angeles on the 20th. Lectures start on the 27th of July. Sounds great. And what about accommodation? Well, first I'm going to stay with Daniel and Susanna, some friends of my parents. You're not staying with them the whole time you're there, are you? 
No, I'll be looking for my own place, but I'm really pleased they'll be around. It'll be good to know I can contact them in case I have any problems. They're meeting me at the airport too. Mind you, I haven't seen them for years. They'll have forgotten what I look like. And what about the course? It looks really interesting. They sent me a reading list, but of course, I haven't got round to opening any of the books yet. So it's going to take a long time to catch up. I'll be studying really hard during the semesters so that I don't have to do much work in the vacations. And when does the first semester end? The 7th of December. Then I'm going to San Francisco for a week. I've always wanted to see the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm going to fly up there if it's not too expensive. Do you know when you'll be back in Los Angeles? Probably mid-December. So you can come any time after that. I'm so looking forward to it. I've always wanted to go to the States. I was going to see my aunt in Seattle a couple of years ago, but I cancelled the trip because she got ill. Will you stop over anywhere on the way out? Maybe New York or Chicago? I haven't really thought about it. But I've only got three weeks, so I think I'll fly directly to Los Angeles. Fine. And I'll meet you at the airport, of course. By the time you come, I'm sure I'll have got to know Ellie really well, so I'll be able to show you all the sights. Yes, I suppose you will. When I come to see you, you'll have been living in California for nearly six months. Hard to imagine, isn't it? Mm -hmm. After Los Angeles, I thought we could go down to a place called Huntington Beach. If you bring your tent, we'll camp there for a few days. The weather will still be quite warm, even in the winter. Isn't it your birthday around then? That's right. I'll be 21 on the 2nd of January. Well, that'll be a really good way to celebrate. The best. I'll need to get back to Los Angeles for when the second semester starts. But you'll be staying longer, won't you? That's right. I don't have to be back in England until later. Well, why don't you go to the Grand Canyon? It's supposed to be spectacular. Yeah, I might think about that. Anyway, as soon as I book my tickets, I'll let you know. OK. We can sort out the details closer to the time. Fine. Look, it's nearly two o'clock. If I don't go now, I'm going to be late for my next lecture. I'll text you. Yeah. See you. Unit 3 And now on Radio Nation, it's 8.30 and here's a summary of the latest news. Air passengers could be hit badly today as cabin crews stay at home in the latest in a series of one-day strikes. The major airlines are warning that up to 100,000 people may experience delays. The managing director of Travel Air, David Wade, had this warning to the unions. I'm sure I don't need to spell out the chaos being caused in the airline industry as a result of these strikes, and I would like to apologise to all our customers. However, the cabin staff must accept the new working conditions if the airline is to compete, and the management has no choice but to stand firm on this issue. But he didn't have to wait long for a response. A union spokesperson said, I can't believe Mr Wade is being so confrontational. We will not be bullied by management. Eventually the airlines will have to return to the negotiating table. Up to 200 teachers and pupils had to be evacuated from Northfield Primary School in South Wales today after a fire broke out in an adjacent building. Although firefighters were able to bring the fire under control fairly quickly, they couldn't prevent the fire damaging the school's sports centre. The head teacher said it might be a number of months before the sports centre is back in operation, although the school itself should be able to reopen early next week. The new Borland Bridge, connecting the island to the mainland, was officially opened today by the Transport Minister. However, it's been in operation for a few weeks already and has received a mixed reception from islanders. From Borland, here's our reporter, Anna Curtis. Yes, the new bridge has stirred up a lot of strong emotion on Borland, and I'm here to gather the views of some of the island's residents. Excuse me, what do you think of the new bridge? I think it will be of great benefit to the island. We used to be terribly isolated here because the ferry service was so bad. It's only a short distance, but the crossing would take over an hour at least. It could be a very rough journey too. Many passengers would get seasick during the crossing. Excuse me, I'm asking people about the effects of the new bridge. They reckon that tourism on the island is set to expand. Is that such a good thing? There are already far too many cars and people. We'll also get wealthy people from the mainland who can afford second homes. That will push up house prices and islanders won't be able to buy properties. That can't be right, surely. There ought to be restrictions on the number of people moving here. 
It's certainly true that the bridge is going to have a major impact on the way of life of the people here over the next few years. But whether that will be a positive or negative effect, only time will tell. Following her report on the high levels of obesity among children, the government's chief health advisor, Professor Carmen Brady, has said that schools have to play a more active role in encouraging children to take up sports. She has also criticised parents. Parents needn't be very interested in sport themselves, but they should give their children whatever encouragement they can. While we were gathering information for our report, we found that some parents will actually discourage their children from taking up a sport on the basis that they might get distracted from their academic studies. This negative attitude to sport mustn't be allowed to continue, not if we are to get on top of the obesity crisis facing the country. And finally, the weather. Well, if you're in the south of the country, you shouldn't be troubled by any rain today. It will be warm, sunny and dry, with temperatures up to 22 degrees Celsius. However, in the north, you're likely to see an occasional shower with maximum temperatures of around 15 degrees. Radio Nation News. Unit 3. Exam Practice. Listening. Part 1. You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, Choose the answer, A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. You hear two people on a radio programme discussing music education for children. Research shows that the optimum time to start music education is between the ages of three and four. As well as improving manual dexterity and concentration, it seems that it may help emotional development too. And starting young on understanding musical notation lays down an excellent foundation for later on. The piano is the instrument that many parents want their children to start learning, and I think three years old is the right time to start. Starting early is vital, but less demanding instruments would be my choice. Things like the recorder or a half-size guitar. Personally, I don't think the piano is the best instrument to start with so early. Children have to show the mental, physical and emotional readiness to learn an instrument like the piano, which obviously takes a lot of effort and commitment. In my experience, very few children under six are able to take on that kind of challenge. Well, I think children of that age can learn to play simple tunes on the piano and they soon progress to more complicated pieces if they can read music. But a rather academic approach will turn children off for life if they're not ready for it. Enjoyment has got to be the priority. Well, enjoyment is certainly important, but if you... Research shows that the optimum time to start music education is between the ages of three and four. As well as improving manual dexterity and concentration, it seems that it may help emotional development too. And starting young on understanding musical notation lays down an excellent foundation for later on. The piano is the instrument that many parents want their children to start learning, and I think three years old is the right time to start. Starting early is vital, but less demanding instruments would be my choice. Things like the recorder or a half-size guitar. Personally, I don't think the piano is the best instrument to start with so early. Children have to show the mental, physical and emotional readiness to learn an instrument like the piano, which obviously takes a lot of effort and commitment. In my experience, very few children under six are able to take on that kind of challenge. Well, I think children of that age can learn to play simple tunes on the piano and they soon progress to more complicated pieces if they can read music. But a rather academic approach will turn children off for life if they're not ready for it. Enjoyment has got to be the priority. Well, enjoyment is certainly important, but if you... Extract 2 you hear part of an interview with a rock climber called Ben. So, Ben, you're well known in the climbing world as a bit of a loner. You prefer climbing without other people. Is that true? Well, to some extent. I've always talked to other climbers about the technical side of things, training, equipment and things like that. But at the end of the day, you've got to learn independently through trial and error. If you're climbing in a group, you'll always compare yourself to others, and that doesn't always help you to improve. It's good to admire other climbers, but different things work best for different people. So, you never climb with other people? As far as possible, I climb alone, but occasionally I look to others for support. 
When I was younger, I used to do most of my climbing during the summer holidays, and I haven't done much winter climbing, so I still feel out of my depth climbing alone on rock faces covered in ice. When it's dangerous like that, you need people who've been brought up with it. It's good to have people around to advise you on what's a safe manoeuvre to make in the circumstances. So, Ben, you're well known in the climbing world as a bit of a loner. You prefer climbing without other people, is that true? Well, to some extent. I've always talked to other climbers about the technical side of things, training, equipment and things like that, but at the end of the day, you've got to learn independently, through trial and error. If you're climbing in a group, you'll always compare yourself to others, and that doesn't always help you to improve. It's good to admire other climbers, but different things work best for different people. So, you never climb with other people? As far as possible, I climb alone, but occasionally I look to others for support. When I was younger, I used to do most of my climbing during the summer holidays, and I haven't done much winter climbing, so I still feel out of my depth climbing alone on rock faces covered in ice. When it's dangerous like that, you need people who've been brought up with it. It's good to have people around to advise you on what's a safe manoeuvre to make in the circumstances. Extract 3. You hear part of an interview with a restaurant critic called Amanda Downing. You're such a household name, it must be terrifying for staff when you go into a restaurant. How do they react? It's true that a lot of people know me, at least in the restaurant world, so I always eat with a friend and they'll make the booking. Often, though, I get recognised, and when that happens, it's inevitable, I suppose, that they take a bit more care over serving the food, and some seem a bit nervous. I've never been given a complimentary meal, though, or anything like that. That would be just too obvious, and of course it could be considered unethical to accept a gift like that. Mm. And what makes a good restaurant? A good restaurant is one where the management and waiting staff have given some thought to why their customers are there. Most restaurant owners believe that the main reason people go to restaurants is for the food, but that's completely wrong. The main reason people go to restaurants is to have a good time, not because they're hungry. So there might be a big difference between the priorities of a restaurant and the priorities of diners. For example, one thing that a restaurant gets judged on is the quality of service. What restaurant owners think is good is service that is efficient, but what customers have as their priority is friendly service. You're such a household name, it must be terrifying for staff when you go into a restaurant. How do they react? It's true that a lot of people know me, at least in the restaurant world, so I always eat with a friend and they'll make the booking. Often, though, I get recognised, and when that happens, it's inevitable, I suppose, that they take a bit more care over serving the food, and some seem a bit nervous. I've never been given a complimentary meal, though, or anything like that. That would be just too obvious, and of course it could be considered unethical to accept a gift like that. Mm. And what makes a good restaurant? A good restaurant is one where the management and waiting staff have given some thought to why their customers are there. Most restaurant owners believe that the main reason people go to restaurants is for the food, but that's completely wrong. The main reason people go to restaurants is to have a good time, not because they're hungry. So there might be a big difference between the priorities of a restaurant and the priorities of diners. For example, one thing that a restaurant gets judged on is the quality of service. What restaurant owners think is good is service that is efficient, but what customers have as their priority is friendly service. Unit 4 So how on earth did they manage to get in? There's no sign of a forced entry. Well, I suppose they could have got in through a window up on the fourth floor. But no one would have dared climb up the outside of the building. Anybody trying to do that would have been seen from the street below. You don't think they would have been able to jump from the block across the road, do you? No, it's much too far. Of course, there's always a fire escape around the back of the building. They could have climbed up there reasonably easily. And after that, they might have been lowered by a rope from the roof. If that was the case, people living in the block of flats behind the museum might have seen something. So we need to talk to them. Right. But we needn't interview everyone in the block, just the people who have windows facing the museum. I'll arrange that. 
If it wasn't a window, the only other possibility is that they went in through the front door. Perhaps they forced a lock. But the door didn't appear to be damaged at all. And the entry code is supposed to be known only by the security guard. So someone else must have opened the door from the inside. Only the security guard was allowed to stay in the museum after it closed. Do you think they somehow persuaded him to let them in? Maybe they just knocked on the front door and he opened it. He surely wouldn't have done something as stupid as that. Do you think he might have been expecting them and that he was part of the gang? But then why would they have attacked him? I don't know. But we better find out all we can about that guard as soon as possible. Now, who was it that raised the alarm? It was the head cleaner who went into the building early this morning. He must have to know the entry code too. Yes, maybe. He says the front door was unlocked when he got here, but he claims he didn't see anything else unusual until he got to the fourth floor. But of course, he might be lying. Yes, he must know that he ought to have called the police as soon as he found the door open. I wonder why he didn't. I think we should talk to him again. I suppose he could be hiding some information from us, and he might be prepared to tell us more if we put a bit of pressure on him. The other puzzling thing is how they took the paintings away. Apparently they're very big, so the robbers must have had to bring a van around to the front of the building. Well, the driver must have been waiting nearby and drove up when they'd got the paintings. They could have loaded the paintings up very quickly and might have driven straight to a port or airport. Anyway, the forensic team should have finished examining the building by now. Once they've done that, I think we should go and look around for ourselves. Unit 5 Right. Perhaps you could tell me something about how you got interested in environmental science and what experience you have in the subject. Well, I've always been fascinated by plants and animals. And then last year, a friend of mine, Mike Proctor, invited me to Brazil. He's the head of a project there run by a European charity. The charity's aim is to help groups of villagers set up their own schools and medical centres. They also encourage sustainable agriculture and the setting up of businesses to sell local handicrafts. Anyway, it was during my stay that I really began to understand the impact of climate change. I want to learn more about this and, more generally, how decision-making on environmental issues in one part of the world can affect the lives of individuals elsewhere. You say you began to understand the impact of climate change. Could you give me an example of what you saw in Brazil that influenced you? Yes, of course. We've all heard about the destruction of the rainforest, and I was able to see examples of that. But also, people don't realise that the climate in the region is changing, and that the speed of change is frightening. There's been a drought there for a number of months, and river levels are low. I had direct experience of this when I travelled with Mike. Having responsibility for the whole project in the area means that his job involves travelling to some pretty remote areas. Sometimes we had to go by boat to get to some of the villages, and we had to carry the boat because there wasn't enough water in the river. And is this change affecting the lives of local people? A huge amount. The main problem has been the effect of the drought on food supplies. The majority of people there are farmers, and all of them have lost animals and crops. The charity's project has been a success so far in that levels of income from the sale of handicrafts have increased. But, of course, financial success isn't everything. It's hard to imagine a future without farming in an area like that. Your trip to Brazil sounds like an amazing experience. And since you've been back, have you done anything to develop your interest in the area? Yes, I've read a book about energy conservation and how this might slow down climate change. And I was particularly interested in how the Netherlands has begun to tackle the problem. The government has introduced some really interesting projects on energy saving in cities. The use of low energy light bulbs to reduce the consumption of lighting energy better insulation for homes, and things like that. There's also a massive recycling scheme, which is saving an enormous amount of waste. What's needed now, though, is to expand work like this across the world. Mm. And what are your plans for the future? What do you want to do after you've left college? Actually, I'd like to go into politics. We've got, somehow, to persuade governments in developed countries to change their priorities. For example, even if just a small percentage of the money spent on the arms trade could go into tackling climate change, I'm sure we could make a difference. 
And you think that as a politician, you'd be able to do this? <laughs> I'd certainly like to try. Before we finish, have you got any questions about the course here at the college? Mm. I've noticed that statistics is included in the course. I'm a bit concerned about that. I wouldn't worry about it. You'd be able to get by with a reasonable knowledge of maths. Oh, that's very reassuring. I also wanted to ask about the field trip for second year students. OK. Second year students go to Nepal in June, looking at the ecology of mountain environments. Oh, that sounds like a fantastic opportunity. Unit 6. Speaker 1. I took up running a couple of years ago. Until then, I did a bit of sport at school, but I didn't do much outside school at all. In fact, I suppose I didn't have many interests, except playing computer games. Then I went to watch my uncle in a 5k fun run. It was to raise money for charity. I thought the whole event was brilliant, and every one of there seemed to be enjoying it. There was another fun run later in the year, and I signed up for a laugh. I didn't do any proper training for it, just a bit of jogging around the park after school. So I was really surprised when I managed to run all the way. Now I run nearly every day, and I get a lot of satisfaction out of it. My friends all think I'm crazy. None of them like the thought of running long distances. I think about all kinds of stuff when I'm running, and I know it's really good for my heart and lungs. Sure, some people get running injuries, but I've been lucky I've had none so far. Speaker 2 I'd never really thought about exercise and keeping fit until a couple of years ago. My boyfriend and I were in town late and we had to run to catch the last bus home, just a couple of hundred metres. By the time we got to the bus stop, both of us were completely exhausted. On the way home, we started talking. Neither of us did any exercise and I didn't do much with my free time, just reading magazines and eating biscuits. By the time we got home, we'd each decided to take up a different activity for six months and see who could lose the most weight. My boyfriend joined a gym and I started running in the local park, just a few hundred metres at first and gradually building up. Now I run a few kilometres each day. Of course, that takes up quite a lot of time and my boyfriend moans about that sometimes. But after I've been sitting at my computer all day, I can't wait to go out for a run. We certainly both got a lot fitter and I've lost a lot of weight. Not all the effects are positive, of course. I've had a few problems with sore knees and sprained ankles. I suppose all exercise carries some risks, but there isn't much evidence that running causes major problems if you warm up carefully and have good footwear. It's one of the few sports where no special equipment's needed, just a pair of running shoes. Speaker 3 I had three older brothers, and I think they could all have been Olympic athletes if they'd had the opportunity. So it was quite natural that I would go out running with them. I think I started at about the age of ten, and I've been running regularly all my life. Now that I'm getting older, I go out running every couple of days, but if the weather's bad, I might go all week without a run. I certainly go out a lot less during the winter. Well... Who would want to go running on a horrible rainy day? Inevitably, you get a few injuries, too. Everyone gets aching muscles after a long run, and I used to get back pain occasionally. But surprisingly, I seem to have fewer injuries now than when I was younger. Maybe it's because I run more slowly. Actually, I feel a lot healthier, and I even sleep a little better after I've been out running. But I think the best thing for me is the social contact. We've got a running club in our village. Uh, I moved here when I retired. And before I joined the club, I had very few friends who lived nearby. Now, many of my closest friends are the runners in the club. Next spring, we're all going to Madrid to run in a marathon for over 60s only. Of course, we know that not all of us will finish, but you can be sure that every one of us will have a really good time. My aim is to complete the course and do it in less than six hours. <laughs> but I know it won't be easy. Unit 6, Exam Practice. Listening, Part 2. You will hear a woman called Janet Naylor talking about her experience as a volunteer in Tanzania. For questions 1 to 8, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. Earlier this year, I fulfilled a lifelong ambition of mine by working for three months as a volunteer in an African country, 
I'm in my late fifties now, and I don't have the commitments that have previously held me back, like bringing up small children. I've worked in marketing for much of my life, and I wanted to use the skills I have to help out in a small way. I applied to do voluntary work a couple of years ago, but it wasn't until about a year later that a suitable scheme came up, and I was asked to go. The reaction of my friends to the news was very interesting. The majority of them told me how impressed they were, and a lot said that given the opportunity, they'd like to do something similar. Although I must say that some of them were not so keen when I told them later about how basic the conditions were. But a few clearly disapproved of what I was doing. They argued that I was patronising Africans by intervening and telling them how to run their lives. But I saw it rather differently. It's true that in an ideal world, development schemes should be set up by the communities themselves that they're going to benefit. But sometimes, local people don't yet have the necessary skills to make them effective, and need some kind of outside expert support, such as international agencies. And that's where I came in. I was an advisor to a scheme based in a village of about two hundred people in Tanzania. It involved building concrete tanks to capture water during the wet season. With the aim of reducing the problem of drought during the rest of the year, with better irrigation would come more reliable crops, so that the villagers wouldn't be so dependent on international aid. The problems there were getting really serious. There had hardly been any rain in the area for the previous three or four years. The whole region was on the brink of starvation, and handouts from charities were the only thing that kept people alive. The scheme had been underway for less than a year when I arrived. And my brief was to suggest ways in which the villagers could market any agricultural production that was surplus to their own requirements, any food that they didn't need themselves. I've heard now that the village is making money from its crops by selling them in other parts of Tanzania and even exporting some produce, and it's built a primary school and a small health centre. It's very gratifying to know that the scheme has completely transformed its prospects. And the village is now well on its way to becoming a thriving community. Now listen to part two again. Unit seven. Re In the studio today, we have the novelist David Bardrath, whose most recent book, A Woman Alone, was published last week. Welcome to the program, David. Well, thanks for inviting me. Now, David, you came relatively late to writing, didn't you? Well, I suppose I'd always been a writer—poems, short stories, and so on—but only my close family had read anything I'd written until I had my first novel published in my early forties. And how did you feel about that? Oh, it felt fantastic having my first book published. At that time, you were a primary school teacher in your native Scotland. At what stage did you leave teaching? Until my third novel was published, I was happy to teach during the day and write in the evening and at weekends. But I found that there wasn't enough time to do both as well as I wanted to, so I left teaching and I started writing professionally. Some of my close friends thought I was mad to give up my job, and I was greatly relieved that my subsequent book sold quite well. So no regrets about leaving teaching? Oh, it was the most difficult decision imaginable. I'd worked at the same school for about fifteen years, and I felt bad leaving the children and also some very close colleagues and friends. But I still live near the school, and I go back on every possible occasion. Tell us something about the process of your writing. How carefully do you outline the story at the very beginning? Before I start writing, I always know how a book is going to end. Although I rarely have a clear idea at the beginning of how the characters will develop. As I write, gradually they grow into real people in my own mind. But sometimes even I'm surprised at how they turn out. And what about your daily work routine? I suppose I'm fairly disciplined in my writing. I'm generally up at about seven in the morning, and I usually start work by about eight o'clock. I work upstairs. We've converted our attic into a study. In the early stages of a new book, I'll often go to the city library in the afternoon to do some research. You don't use the internet. As a rule, I prefer finding information from books, and I only turn to the internet as a last resort. Let's go on now to your latest novel, A Woman Alone. I was surprised to find it set in Norway. Yes, I finished my previous book last January. I'd been feeling really tired, and I was aware that I needed rest and a source of fresh ideas. I taught English in Sweden after I left university, and I still speak Swedish quite well. But I hadn't been to Norway before. There are a lot of historical links between Norway and the north of Scotland, so I decided to spend some weeks there. 
Some of the geographical settings used in A Woman Alone are based on places I visited while I was travelling around. And A Woman Alone seems to be more personal than many of your other works. I'd already decided that I wanted to write about a single parent family. Uh, as you may know, my sister and I were brought up by my mother on her own. Uh, the mother in the story, Elsa, is very protective of her children, as was my own mother, but although they have certain common characteristics, Elsa is not really modelled on my mother. Elsa is quite a dominant figure and a woman susceptible to periods of depression, whereas my mother was a rather gentle woman and always calm. And when you're researching and writing books, do you have time to read other people's novels? I do, yes. One novelist I greatly admire is William Boyd. He writes simply but with great control of language. I've just finished his excellent novel, Restless. It's a quite remarkable story. I'll certainly add that to my list of books to read. <laughs> And what about your present writing project? What are you working on now? Well, I don't know if I can tell you yet. I'm still sketching out the plot, so it's very much in the early stages. I know there'll be a lot of people waiting eagerly to get hold of it. David Bardriff, thank you for talking to us. My pleasure. Unit 8. Hi, everyone. Hi, Alice. How are you doing? Hi, Alice. Listen, we need to make a decision about our holiday. If we don't decide soon, it'll be too late to get anywhere to stay. It's got to be Corfu, hasn't it? I'm not sure how we get there. Well, my brother went there last year. He flew to Rome, then took a train to Brindisi, and then had to get a boat. No, it's not as difficult as that. Uh, we could fly from London to Athens and then take a flight from there to Corfu. It takes about six hours. I've had a look on the internet and it looks like there's a flight that leaves London at about 10 in the morning. But we need to book soon. The longer we leave it, the more expensive it's going to be. But obviously, it would be much easier getting to Athens. There's lots of flights and we wouldn't have to change. Then what about somewhere to stay? Aren't hotels supposed to be pretty expensive in Corfu? Well, I've found three that seem possible. I've printed off the details here. They all look pretty good and they're right next to the best beach on the island. Which one's cheapest? Uh, this one here. 60 euros a night for a double room. Well, accommodation would be cheaper in Athens, I think. It says in my guidebook that there are reasonable hotel rooms for as little as 40 euros a night. Uh, there's one here recommended. It's a bit far from the city centre, but it's on the metro, so it's easy enough to get into the centre from there. It wouldn't be as nice as being able to look out over a beach. What worries me is what we'd do in Athens for a couple of weeks. Look, Athens is one of the oldest cities in the world. There's lots of museums, and then there's the Acropolis with the Parthenon. I remember going to Rome with my parents once. We spent the whole time looking at museums and art galleries, and it was the most boring holiday I've ever had. Yeah, I think it'd be more fun to go to Corfu. I much prefer lying on a beach to walking around art galleries all day, and it would be more peaceful than being in the city. I want to come home more relaxed and healthier, not unhealthier than when I went away. Yes, I'd prefer to go to an island too, although I don't want to lie on the beach all day. Maybe we could hire a car and explore the island a bit. Yeah, we want to see as much as possible and a car would be the easiest way of getting around. It's probably not as unspoiled as some of the other Greek islands, but it's still supposed to be a really beautiful place, so we'll want to see as much as we can. What about the weather in August? I know we all want to see some sunshine, but isn't Athens supposed to be incredibly hot in August? I've heard that it gets so hot that a lot of people leave the city to find somewhere cooler. No, my friend Mark used to work there as an English teacher, and he reckons the heat is nowhere near as bad as people say. Anyway, isn't Corfu likely to be as hot as Athens at that time of the year? I think you get the breezes off the sea. Unit 9 First, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr Lynn Jones, and I'll be taking you for the first five lectures in this course on first language learning. I'd like to begin today's session by highlighting some of the main areas that I'll be covering with you. From the moment they wake up, infants are keen to interact and communicate with others. This interaction may not, of course, be with people. Early morning sounds from a child's bedroom may be them babbling to themselves, or speech as a child speaks to their toys. I recently bought my two-year-old daughter a cuddly elephant and it has become the person she talks to each morning lying in bed. And as my three-year-old dresses herself, she likes to talk to each item of clothing. Red jumper, your turn. 
So the first lecture will be about what I call private conversations. Of course, a child's parents are usually their most important focus of interaction. And in the second session, we'll be exploring the part that parents play in very early communication. The first stage of interactive play might be a child giving a toy to their mother or offering her some food. And even before they can use words, infants employ their faces, bodies and sounds to communicate what they want. A hand outstretched to a toy could mean, give it to me, or a broken toy handed to a parent with an, ah, might mean, mend this for me. Parents encourage this kind of interaction by, for example, hiding an object behind them and asking, where's it gone? At first, infants point, and then later verbalise a response. The importance of infants listening to adults speaking for the development of their own language cannot be overestimated. Many parents play follow-the-instructions games with their children when they first become mobile, saying things like, go to the toy box and find the car for me, or fetch me your hat. Although, as the parents of older children will know, the novelty for children of following instructions soon wears off. Reading stories for young children is a similarly important part of this process of listening and understanding. But even when children are not being actively encouraged to listen, they will be seeking to make sense of the language they hear. When children appear to be busying themselves with their toys or applying themselves to painting a picture, they will be absorbing the speech they hear around them and often copying what they hear in their own speech. So the third area we'll be looking at is the relationship between listening and the development of speech. Interactions between infants will often copy parental speech and behaviour. Two small children at a nursery school might hug each other when they meet each morning because that's what parents do to the children when they are collected from school. Most parents at some time hear their child say something and ask themselves the question, did they copy that from us? Of course, it's very difficult to assess exactly the extent of parental influence. Take, for example, the area of conflict. It is not uncommon to see in a nursery school two small children playing with each other peacefully one moment, but they might be hitting each other the next. If their language is more developed, they might each blame the other for a broken toy or a spilt drink. While these would be uncharacteristic of normal adult interaction, perhaps the conflicts between parents witnessed by small children somehow are mimicked in these arguments. A fourth area, then, will be the extent to which patterns of communication are copied. A final subject I will examine during the course is that of problems in language acquisition. We might consider first language learning natural, a normal process that everyone goes through, and Dr Jackman will be describing this process to you in detail in later talks. However, a significant number of children either acquire language more slowly than the usual rate or never reach an average level of language proficiency. This topic will obviously be of particular importance to those of you who are going on to work with children with learning difficulties or as speech therapists. So, first of all then, let's look at the private conversations that infants engage in. Unit 10. Re Hello. All you regular listeners to Traveller's World will know that our intrepid reporters are sent around the globe, coming back with stories of marvellous times spent in exotic locations. In today's programme, however, we begin with a trip that had a nightmare start, just to reassure you that even professional travellers can get it wrong. So, Simon Richer, tell us your sorry tale. Hello, Jackie. Yes, my assignment was to visit the beautiful island of Lombok in Indonesia. I was supposed to have been flying from London to Singapore and then from Singapore to Mataram in Lombok. I arranged for a taxi to collect me from home in good time, but it eventually turned up an hour late. So you were late to the airport? Got there just as they were closing the check-in desk. Oof. I handed over my suitcase, but then, to my horror, I found I didn't have my passport. Oof. I'd been so anxious to get into the taxi that I'd forgotten to pick it up. How very unprofessional of you. <laughs> I know. In 25 years of air travel, that's the first time it's ever happened to me. So, back home I went to get it, and then off to plead with the airline. 
Eventually, they found me an alternative flight a day later. It meant flying to Bali and then taking a ferry to Lombok, but I decided to go ahead. The journey went very smoothly until we got to Lombok. Apparently, there'd been a fire and we were made to wait outside the harbour for hours and the sea was very rough. And you were seasick. Very. And, of course, because I'd changed my flight, I also had to stay in a different hotel. <sighs> I'd really been looking forward to staying at the Hotel Sanar in Mataram, but I had to make do with a less luxurious place. No pool and no TV in my room. <laughs> and what about Lombok itself? Oh, it was beautiful. A number of people had encouraged me to go to the coral reefs off the northwest coast of the island. I managed to find a friendly taxi driver called Aaron to take me and wait for me there. Now, when I was younger, I used to hate swimming in the sea, but I went snorkelling for the first time just last year and loved it, so I couldn't wait to have another go. The coral was just a few metres off the beach, so it was quite safe. Until what happened? <laughs> well, I'd been swimming for a few minutes. The coral was fantastic, some of the best I've seen. And then, all of a sudden, there was this huge jellyfish in front of me, and I couldn't get out of the way. As it swam past, I felt it stinging me across the stomach. I started screaming, it was incredibly painful, and headed back to the beach. Fortunately, there was a small settlement nearby, and some of the villagers helped carry me back to my taxi. Aaron was fantastic. He took me to the local clinic, and the doctors were excellent. I really appreciated them looking after me so well. It was sore for a few days, though, and I was told to take things easy. So, how did you spend the rest of your time there? Well, Aaron really took care of me. The next day we went on to drive towards Mount Rinjani, the highest mountain in Lombok. The mountain's thought by some to have been created by the god Batara. According to tradition, he created light and the earth and still lives in Rinjani. And as we stopped to admire the amazing sunset, it was almost possible to believe it. I really regret not having taken my camera with me. Oh, no camera. Oh, no. That was another of my disasters. Oh. I'd picked up my passport, but then I'd left my camera. Oh. I tried using the camera in my mobile phone, but the quality was pretty poor. Hmm. And what about the people in Lombok? Aaron's family lived close to the mountain. I was really interested in seeing what it was like in a traditional Lombok family, and he invited me to stay with them. Very soon I came to realise that the Lombok people are very kind and hospitable. It wasn't long before I was beginning to feel quite at home there. Aaron's family are Sasak, who make up about 80% of the population. The Sasaks are thought to have originally come to Lombok from India or Burma. So the trip actually ended quite positively? Absolutely. I considered staying for a few more days, but I didn't have time. But I really hope to go back in the next few years. The island obviously wants to encourage tourism to boost the economy, but I'd love to think that it could avoid a huge expansion in visitors. Thank you, Simon. Unit 11. The story of radio probably begins with Heinrich Hertz, who was the first to produce radio waves in a laboratory. He devised an experiment in which a spark jumped across a gap in a metal ring when a sparking coil was held a few metres away. The model that you can see in case one shows how this works. For most people, however, it is the Italian Guglielmo Marconi whose name is mainly associated with the development of radio. Before Marconi's breakthrough, it was possible only to send electrical messages, or telegraphs, along fixed wires. This obviously greatly restricted the places to which telegraphs could be sent. Marconi's goal was to find a system where telegraphic messages could be transmitted without the need for the connecting wires that were used in the electric telegraph. For some time, he was only able to transmit signals over a few hundred metres, and there were many people who doubted Marconi would ever succeed. The first public demonstration of the power of radio came in 1901, when Marconi announced that he had received a transmission from across the Atlantic. The old photograph that you can see ahead of you shows Marconi at Signal Hill in St John's, Newfoundland, where this first transmission was received. Soon after, Marconi opened a wireless telegraph factory in England, which employed around 50 people. There are just a few of the wireless telegraphs that the factory produced left in the world, an example of which you can see in case two. 
These early radio systems could only be used for Morse code, in which each letter of the alphabet is represented by a combination of dots and dashes. Radio waves could not carry speech until a method had been developed whereby the low frequency waves produced in a microphone could be combined with high frequency radio waves. The invention that made this possible was the vacuum tube or thermionic valve. You can see examples of these in case 3. In several countries, radios became the main means of communication during the 1930s and 1940s. The next photograph shows a family gathered around the radio in the mid-1930s. Radio entertainers, many of whom became household names, were highly paid. In Britain, the popularity of radio increased until 1952, by which time four out of five households owned one. You can probably guess the reason why radio began to lose some of its popularity in the early 1950s. Competition from television. Move now to room 36, where you can find information and displays about the early days of television. Unit 12. Re Photographs of food are all around us, in advertisements, magazines and cookbooks. Today's guest is Helena Palmer, who's made a highly successful career out of food photography. Welcome, Helena. Thank you. So, how did you become involved in food photography? Was your first interest the food or the photography? Oh, definitely photography first. When I was quite young, 10 or 11, I started using an old camera belonging to my father. I became fascinated with taking shots of people, my friends and my family in particular. And were you also interested in the way food was presented? In restaurants, for example? My parents, not having much money, rarely took us to restaurants, but my mother was an excellent cook. I used to take shots of her in the kitchen, and also some of the special things that she'd prepare, birthday cakes and things like that. And you left school quite young. Yes, I wasn't very gifted academically, so at 16 I left school and went to help out at a local photographic studio. It was easy to find a photographer wanting to take on an assistant for no pay. <laughs> for a couple of years I lived at home with my parents, who supported me financially. And I was very lucky that the photographer who took me on taught me a lot. She was really the first person to encourage me to take up food photography. She always let me help out with food shoots wedding cakes, publicity photos for local restaurants and so on. Mm -hmm. Then when I was 18, there was a major photography competition being held in London and one of the categories was celebrations. So I entered a portfolio of photographs just for the experience, I thought. By that time, I was getting quite into it. And you won. <laughs> That's right. At that time, I was the youngest person in the competition to win any of the major categories. Now, it's sometimes said that photographing food is the most difficult job for a professional photographer. Is that really true? It can certainly be very difficult to make it look appetising. Food photography is all done in studios, and the biggest problem is the heat produced by the lights. It can take a very long time to get everything exactly right for a shot, and by that time, a chef's carefully prepared salad might look limp, or a cream cake becomes a mound of wet sponge. So how do you get round that? Well, firstly, the food in photographs used to illustrate cookbooks and magazine articles isn't always entirely authentic. You mean it's made of plastic? Well, some of it, perhaps, but <laughs> not all of it. If great food could be copied in plastic, I'd be out of a job. <laughs> We have a number of techniques to help us out. First, a lot of the items in the photograph can be set up early. Glasses, cutlery, flowers perhaps. Mm -hmm. And then we put in some material to substitute for the food, something with the same size, shape and colour. Often we just make this quickly in the studio from cardboard or any other material available and paint it. Personally, I prefer food not made of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? In the meantime, a food stylist prepares the food to be photographed. A food stylist? Oh, yes. Most professional food photographers employ a food stylist nowadays. As soon as I'm satisfied with the setting, lighting and so on, we take out the artificial food and put in the real thing. But the food starts to dry out very quickly. 
so I generally have with me a spray bottle containing glycerin mixed with water. Glycerin's a liquid, completely colourless, that's often used to sweeten food. It's great for keeping food looking shiny and moist. Another difficulty is that food is sometimes meant to be hot and steaming, but of course, by the time we photograph it, it's completely cold. The only thing to do in that case is to create steam from elsewhere. We use cotton wool balls soaked in water and then put in a microwave. Ah. These steam nicely for a couple of minutes and we position them so that it looks like it's the food steaming. Something else I wouldn't be without is a small blowtorch. What do you use that for? <laughs> Hundreds of things. Quickly melting butter over vegetables, browning toast... A technique that might be used in photographing meat is to take a piece of, say, chicken, use the blowtorch for a while so that it's nicely golden brown, and then spray some glycerin on the outside to make it look moist. It looks great in the photo, but it might be raw on the inside. <laughs> Helena, it's been fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much for coming into the studio. My pleasure. Unit 13 Thanks to both of you for filling in the questionnaire about your diet and for agreeing to discuss the issues that it raised. First of all, Maria, could you describe your eating habits on a typical day? Well, on a typical working day, I usually start with a piece of toast and a glass of orange juice. For lunch, I generally have a sandwich and a packet of crisps as I'm sitting at my desk. When I get home late, I take a ready meal out of the freezer and put it in the microwave. Corries are really good, or something with noodles. And what about you, Stefan? I'm pretty much the same, actually. Although at the weekend I like to make something myself, so as not to eat processed food all the time. I'll perhaps roast a chicken or do a salad. At the weekend I'm often with friends and will usually go out to eat, seeing that none of us likes cooking. OK. Can you tell me how your diet now is different from when you were younger? Say, when you were a teenager? Well, when I was younger, my mother used to keep an eye on what I ate. She tried very hard to encourage me to eat healthily. I think she made a particular effort as I was often ill as a child. She also talked to me about the food she made so that I'd learn about diet and nutrition. Right. Stefan? Yes. I suppose because it's so easy to buy ready meals from the supermarket, it makes me quite lazy about cooking, and in that way my diet isn't so good. But in some ways it's better now though. If I get hungry, I'll eat some fruit, whereas at school I'd buy a bar of chocolate. I remember once I was eating some sweets in my bedroom when my mother walked in. I got a long lecture on the dangers of too much sugar. But overall you feel your diet is less healthy than it was, say, ten years ago? Yes, I think that's true, in that I ate more regularly then and had a more balanced diet. OK, so what are the main problems you see in your present diet and what would you most like to change? Well, for me, I think the biggest problem is breakfast. I don't eat much for breakfast because I'm always in a rush. I know that's not good for me and I'd like to have something more substantial before I leave home in the morning. But I have to get out by 7.30 in order to catch my bus, so I really don't have time. My biggest problem is that I tend to snack a lot. When I've had one of those ready meals, I feel hungry by the time I go to bed. So sometimes I get up in the night and have a snack, although I know it's bad for me. I must be eating too much because I've been getting a bit overweight recently. And as I put on weight, it gets more and more difficult to exercise. I was absolutely exhausted when I had to run for the bus yesterday. Thanks. And what's preventing you from making the changes that you'd like to make in your diet? I suppose time is the big problem. Although I'd like to eat more fresh food, I don't have time to prepare meals in the evenings. And I don't have the opportunity to go shopping while I'm working. Well, my problem is that I'm not a very good cook. I actually read a lot about food and health and what I should be eating, but it's very hard to put a healthy diet into practice, despite the fact that I know all about the theory. And most recipes in magazines are no use to me because of the time they take. It would be really helpful. Unit 14. Plans to open a new zoo at Twyford have caused a major outcry among animal rights campaigners. 
With me in the studio to discuss the issue are Nadia Muller from the organisation Save the Animals, which campaigns against zoos, Liam Borg, who plans to open Twyford Zoo, and Marion Khan, who runs a safari park in the south of England, where visitors can drive their own cars through large enclosures where wild animals run free. Liam Borg, if I could come to you first, why is another zoo needed? Aren't there enough already? Well, zoos have a number of very important roles. Uh, first of all, they're of enormous educational value. If we didn't have zoos, most people would never see wild animals in real life. The fact that there is no large zoo in this part of the country means that there's a real need for a zoo at Twyford. We want to make it as easy as possible for young people to come along so that they can learn about wild animals. Second, rare and endangered species can be preserved and hopefully bred in captivity, making sure that the species survives. If we'd introduced captive breeding earlier, we would have prevented the extinction of a number of animals. I'm thinking of animals like the Tasmanian tiger or the Chinese river dolphin. Unless we expand captive breeding, many more animals will die out. Nadia Muller? Your view on this? Well, certainly we should have captive breeding programs if it will help save species. But this doesn't have to be in a zoo, where animals are often kept in small enclosures and cages. If they were in the wild, they would have more space to roam free. And so many other aspects of zoos are unnatural for wild animals. It's not natural for different species to live separately from each other, or for them to be given food at regular times, rather than hunt for it. And then there's the cruelty involved in capturing and transporting wild animals to zoos. But what you've got to remember is that many animals in zoos nowadays were actually born in captivity. That's no excuse. Even if wild animals are born in a zoo, it's still cruel to keep them in a small enclosure where they often become unhappy and prone to illness. But if there's a health problem, vets deal with it quickly. In the wild, an animal that becomes ill is much more likely to die or be eaten. That's true, of course. In the wild, animals do die through illness or are attacked by other animals. But this is perfectly normal and how they lived for centuries before we started hunting them. Marion Khan, can I bring you in here? You were disappointed that Twyford was to be a zoo and not a safari park. Yes, I certainly was. First of all, I agree with Nadia that it's inhumane to keep animals in the conditions you find in most zoos. Safari parks offer all the educational experience of zoos, uh, the close contact with animals, but they also allow animals to roam free in large enclosures. Safari parks are also very active in captive breeding programs, of course. The decision to make Twyford a zoo rather than a safari park is a lost opportunity. I'm all in favour of safari parks, provided that the animals are well looked after. Unfortunately, that hasn't always been the case in the past. But they can never replace zoos. They're places where large animals, mainly from Africa, giraffes, elephants, lions and so on, roam free. But you can't have small animals roaming around. If they're not eaten by the larger animals first, they'll be killed by visitors' cars. If I could just get a word in here, Save the Animals believes that safari parks are not an acceptable substitute for zoos. Even though they say they are concerned about the welfare of animals, just like zoos, they are still businesses mainly out to make a profit. Entertaining visitors is a priority, not the welfare of animals. Our view is that wild animals should be protected in their natural habitat. There are many successful reserves in Africa, for example, where wild animals roam peacefully. But all that costs huge amounts of money that can only be provided by rich tourists who come to see the animals. Most families can't afford to make trips like that to see them. Safari parks allow city-dwelling children from all levels of society access but to... But animal welfare is more important. In reserves, animals can be monitored and treated for illness, and they can be protected from poachers. And they have as much space as they need to live their lives freely. So long as developed countries put money into these reserves, species will be preserved. I'm sorry, but that's unrealistic. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for tonight. Mariam Khan, Nadia Muller, Liam Borg. Thank you. Unit 14. Exam Practice. Listening, Part 4. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about cooking. Look at Task 1. 
For questions 1 to 5, choose from the list A to H, the person who is speaking. Now look at task 2. For questions 6 to 10, choose from the list A to H, what each speaker is expressing. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. Speaker 1. By the time I get home after a hard day at work, and with the prospect of a long evening of preparation and marking ahead of me, the last thing I want to do is spend a lot of time in the kitchen. I live on my own, so dinner isn't a time to talk and relax, unless I've got friends round, which usually happens just at the weekend. I just tend to grab a sandwich or microwave a ready meal and eat it while I'm watching the news on TV or working. If I want good food, there are some pretty decent restaurants around here, although I don't go out to eat all that often. Speaker 2 Even when I'm travelling abroad, I'd rather go somewhere that serves the kind of food I'm used to having at home. Steak and chips, maybe a burger or a pizza and things like that. Sometimes this gets to be a bit of a problem if I'm transporting stuff to somewhere off the beaten track and there's only places that serve local food. If I don't know the place I'm going to, somewhere I haven't been to before, I'll generally take a lot of food from home to keep me going for a few days, and then I eat in a cab rather than eat out. I prefer it that way. Speaker 3 when I was training, I lived at home and my mum did all the cooking unless she was away from home. She really enjoys it, so she didn't mind. Now I realise I should have paid more attention to what she was doing. But she's offered to lend me some recipe books and give me some tips, so that will really help. But just now, I'm rushed off my feet. I'm working in the accident and emergency department and we have to do long hours and night shifts every other week. If I wasn't so busy, I'd certainly like to cook more. Hopefully, things will be less frantic when I get moved to the children's ward at the end of the year. Speaker 4 I went off to France for a year after I finished school and really got hooked on good food and cooking during the time that I was there. Now, unless I've got lectures first thing in the morning, I generally go down to the market to get the best quality stuff. It's a real experience shopping there. None of us living in the flat has got a lot of money to spare, but you can get some fantastic bargains at some of the stalls. Then in the evening I generally cook for my flatmates. They're pretty appreciative, and if they enjoy what I've cooked, well, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Speaker 5 I'm at home most of the time, and I don't have a set pattern of work. If the writing's going well, I might just work through from 8 in the morning to 3 in the afternoon without taking a break, unless the sun's shining, and then I might go out for a walk, probably in the park across the road. This means that I tend not to eat regularly, and sometimes I forget to buy anything in the shops. So I'll often go out and get a takeaway or something late in the day. There are plenty of places close by. Not very nutritious, I realize, but it's difficult if you've got deadlines to meet. Now listen to part four again. Unit 15. Have you seen Sam's article for this week? No, not yet. He'd got as far as Naples last week, hadn't he? Mm. Go on, read it out. Right. He's called it Rest and Rats, from Naples to Amalfi. When I last wrote, I was just north of Naples. I was tired, had big blisters on my feet, and, having fallen over a number of times, I was feeling thoroughly miserable. Now, a week later, I'm sitting in a restaurant, looking out over the Mediterranean, watching the sun go down, and life has improved greatly. That's a bit better. Mm -hmm. To hear him grumbling last week, you'd think he was about to get on the next flight home. <laughs> he sounds in good form now. Listen to this. I had no idea where I was heading when I walked into Naples. Exhausted by a difficult few days, I was only interested in finding a bed for the night. Not wanting to carry my backpack any further than I needed to, I went to the first hotel I came across. But I struck lucky. I'd found a small, friendly hotel. In fact, the welcome I got at the hotel made me decide to stay for a couple of days. While in Naples, I did what all visitors do – I took a tour to Vesuvius and Pompeii. 
fascinating places, and it was so good to sit on a coach and give my feet a rest. You've been there, haven't you? Yes, I went a couple of years ago. Pompeii is amazing. I don't imagine he rested his feet that much, though. <laughs> it's such a big place to walk around. What else does he say? Ah,、uh, let's see. But after a couple of days of rest and relaxation, I was ready to get back on the trail. Before leaving Naples, I bought yet more walking socks and a new pair of boots. These are not just any old boots, though. Made from the softest leather imaginable, they are as comfortable as a pair of slippers. He must be really pleased. He was getting so many blisters with the old pair. Having left the sprawl of the city behind me, I walked up into the hills to avoid the long trek around the coast. There is spectacular scenery up there and beautiful views to the sea. On the downside, though, the hills are covered in thorny bushes, and the whole area is very rocky. At times, it was difficult to follow the paths as they are not well marked, and I often had to retrace my steps. I also had a few unpleasant encounters with the local wildlife. Walking into one village, I was met by a pack of unfriendly dogs. Snarling aggressively, the dogs were pretty terrifying at first. But I found that if I ignored them, they soon lost interest in me. I met some smaller wildlife too. The first night on the hills, I pitched my tent and was ready to sleep. But opening up my sleeping bag, I discovered a scorpion. You're kidding! Aren't they dangerous? <laughs> well, Sam obviously wasn't sure. I'm no expert on scorpions, and I didn't know if this one was poisonous. I shook it out of my sleeping bag, well away from the tent, and made sure it was heading off in the opposite direction before I settled down for the night. But then, around two in the morning, having been woken up by a scratching sound, I found a large rat trying to get into my backpack. Fortunately, it ran off when I threw my boots at it. What with sleeping so badly and a long and difficult walk along some treacherous paths down from the hills. It was quite a relief to get to Amalfi this afternoon. I'm now ready for dinner. I've been recommended the local speciality of lasagna with ricotta cheese, and a few more miles of walking tomorrow towards Ravello. This time, though, it will be along the coast, and I hope scorpion and rat-free. Another report next week. <laughs> well, it sounds like he's enjoying Amalfi anyway. He hasn't got much further to go, has he? No. Probably another two or three weeks, and he'll be back with us. Unit sixteen. First of all, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you this evening. I'm sure you all know the area, a couple of miles out of the village, known as the Norton Marsh. You've probably also heard that the marsh has been given to the NWT to look after. Unfortunately, the marsh has been neglected for many years. It's overgrown, paths have disappeared, and the stream running through the area is blocked by rubbish. Our plan is to return the marsh to its natural state as far as possible. We'd like to follow the example of what they've done at Broadstone Park, which many of you will have been to. A few years ago, it was a wilderness. Now it's a thriving nature reserve full of animal, bird, and plant life, with a popular nature trail for visitors. Broadstone Park is part of the Montague family estate, and as such, was largely funded by private means. As a charitable trust, we have to rely on contributions from the public, and we have to face up to the fact that we don't have the resources at the moment to achieve our aims. <laughs> don't worry, I'm not asking you for your money this evening, but I am asking for your help. We're looking for volunteers to help us work on the marsh over the next few years. For example, we need people to clear the vegetation, maintain paths, clear the stream, and build fences. Clearing the vegetation is something that is urgently needed. But why should you volunteer? Well, the reason for most people is that they want exercise and fresh air. And it's also good to know they're helping the environment. There's a great social side to the NWT too. I can guarantee that you'll make a lot of new friends, and we organise barbecues and other social events. 
If you don't fancy the physical work that's involved at the marsh, you can still help. We also need people to address envelopes, deliver promotional material and publicise the NWT on the internet. Whether you help with the outdoor or indoor work depends on you. It's entirely up to you to decide how much time you can give to work at the NWT. We will be very grateful for whatever time people can spare. Nine o'clock is when we usually meet on Saturday and Sunday mornings. Just come along to the marsh and we'll show you what to do. You don't have to make a decision tonight. You can get in touch with me at any time. If you've got any questions about what I've said so far, I'd be very happy to answer them. What you've told us is very interesting and I'd like to be involved, but I'm not a member of the NWT and I've heard it's quite expensive to join. The fact that you're not a member of the Trust makes no difference. We're just looking for people with enthusiasm, commitment and some spare time. Can I ask why the marsh was given to the NWT? Uh, well, uh, Mr Reynolds, the man who gave us the land, has been a supporter of the NWT for many years and wanted us to take over the area a long time ago. Unfortunately, he'd been in a dispute over property with his brother and there was some debate as to whether he could legally give us the land. That dispute has now been resolved, so he got his wish, and the land is now ours. I'd like to be involved, but I don't know whether or not I'd be able to come on a regular basis. Would that be a problem? Not at all. Come when you can. You'll be made very welcome. I don't have a car. Does the NWT organise lifts to the marsh, as I don't know if I can get there by public transport? There is a bus, the number 45, that goes from town past the marsh. Although I can't remember whether it runs on Sundays. Uh, no, the Sunday service was cancelled a while ago. Anyway, we organise lifts for people who don't have their own cars. And each weekend, one person is responsible. You can phone whoever is in charge of arranging lifts on the weekend you want to come and we'll make sure someone will collect you from your home. And take you back, of course. <laughs> Unit 17. Sahar. I learnt to drive with a driving instructor and I think there are lots of advantages to this. Firstly, cars like the one I learnt in have dual control so the instructor can take over accelerating, braking and stuff. Also, my instructor never got annoyed, however badly I was driving. Even if I did something incredibly stupid like stalling in the middle of a busy road, he'd stay completely cool. He was really encouraging as well as being incredibly patient. We used to stop driving at some point during the lesson, and he would ask me how I felt I'd improved, so he'd always be focusing on what I was doing right. Another thing is that, being so experienced, he'd got lots of really useful tips to pass on. Like, for example, reversing around corners. At first, I couldn't get the hang of this at all. However I had the mirror positioned, I just couldn't judge where the back of the car was. But he told me exactly what to do, how to sit, what I should be able to see out of the mirror and windows and so on. And after that, it was dead easy. There were disadvantages, of course. Occasionally, my usual driving instructor was ill, so the driving school sent along a replacement, that was a bit disappointing because he was great and I didn't want to be taught by anyone else. Even so, I always found the replacements very patient and helpful. Another advantage is that experienced instructors know when you're good enough to pass, which I think is kind of difficult for non-professionals to judge. I just carried on having lessons until my instructor said I was ready to take the driving test. And he was right. I passed first time. Although it's expensive having driving lessons, I'd really recommend it. Claudio. My mum taught me to drive because I couldn't afford to pay for driving lessons. I think there's a lot of other good things about having your parents teach you besides saving money. You've got to book driving lessons in advance, but you can go out with your parents whenever it suits you. And you can spend a lot more time practising as well. For example, my mum used to come and collect me from college in the car and I'd drive home. What's more, she'd let me drive when we went shopping. My mum was a great teacher. Even though she doesn't have a professional qualification or anything, she's got lots of experience to pass on. I was lucky, though, because she knew a deserted airfield near to where we live, 
and for the first few lessons, Mum took me there to practice. She wouldn't let me drive on busy roads before I could control the car reasonably well, and as long as I didn't do anything stupid, she stayed pretty calm. The only time I remember her getting stressed was when I was overtaking. I used to find it really hard. It was very different with my dad, though. He took me out once when Mum was away. We'd hardly driven out of our road before we were shouting at each other. Then he made me practice hill starts for an hour. That's something I still have problems with. And we just snapped at each other all the time. Of course, one disadvantage of learning with your parents is that you have to pay a lot to insure the car. But apart from that, I think it's much better. Unit 18 a government report published today has shown a dramatic fall in recorded crime over the last 10 years. With me to discuss the report is the Home Affairs Minister, Kate Pullman. Minister, you must be very pleased with the findings. Yes, indeed. I was delighted when I was given the figures. When we got elected 10 years ago, one of our priorities was a reduction in the disturbingly high crime figures. Obviously, the policies that we've put into place have had a significant impact – so that during our period in office, there's been a 40% fall in the risk of being a victim of crime. So can you pinpoint what measures have had the most significant effect? Well, I think I'd highlight three things. First, attitudes to committing crime have changed significantly since Peter Miles was appointed head of the police service. He's been successful in getting more police officers on the streets, and this has meant that a much higher proportion of offenders have been arrested during the last 10 years than ever before. Second, a huge amount has been invested in surveillance, particularly closed-circuit television. CCTV has been introduced into most city centres, and it's used widely now in helping to prevent car crime in particular. And third, I'd pick out our Make Amends scheme. Most people found guilty of vandalism are now made to repair the damage they've caused and this has discouraged young people in particular from causing damage to property. The effect of this is becoming obvious. People are seeing less graffiti in city centres, for example. It's been so successful that a number of other countries are considering adopting a similar policy. But it's not all good news, is it? While overall crime levels have fallen, some categories of crime have risen quite sharply, haven't they? Street crime is up over 25%. It's true that there has been a surge in street crime. The reason for this can be found in the huge increase in the number of mobile phones. These have become a particular target for street robbers. But this figure is expected to fall rapidly as new technology starts being used to trace stolen mobiles. If they can be traced, they'll be a much less attractive target. And drug-related crime is on the increase? Well, it's certainly true that more people were caught selling drugs. It's not clear, though, whether there are more people out there selling drugs or whether there has been better policing and so more arrests. There have been some questions raised about the accuracy of the figures in the report. Well, it may be that some minor mistakes were made in collecting the figures, but I don't think anyone would deny the general trends that are reported. Finally, can I turn to the issue of the public perception of crime, which the report also investigates? It must concern you that, despite the number of crimes falling in recent years, a majority of people believe that the crime rate has actually gone up. Everyone you speak to seems to have been a victim or no victim of crime. If I can give a personal example, my house was broken into only last week and I had my TV and stereo taken. Virtually every person in my road has had a burglar alarm fitted recently. I'm very sorry to hear that. Yes, there is a problem of public perception, but we're taking steps to improve this. For example, our latest poster campaign is intended to reassure people that violent crime is falling nationally, but it'll take a long time for perceptions to change, I think. You don't believe then, as many people do, that crime is actually on the increase, but that fewer crimes are reported to the police? I do accept that some of the fall might have been caused by lower rates of reporting, but I'm sure this has had a very small impact on the figures. Kate Pullman, thank you very much. Thank you. Unit 19 Oh, there you are, Layla. I've been looking for you. So, how did the meeting go? Well, it was really interesting. There were a couple of representatives from the airport, and one of those, a Mr Kelly, spoke first. 
Then there was a short presentation by Sue Ray. Who's Sue Ray? The head of the No to Airport Expansion Group. After that, there were questions from the audience. Some of the people there got pretty angry. I'm not surprised. Everyone I've spoken to thinks it's awful. Yeah, I thought so too before the meeting, but I'm not so sure now. I agree with the anti expansion group that the plans will change the area, but maybe change isn't such a bad thing. So the airport authorities have convinced you then? <laughs> not entirely. They told us that the expansion would create around 2,000 jobs directly, people employed at the airport. They also said that it might increase tourism in the region. I wasn't so sure about this. I asked how it would boost tourism, and they admitted that they're not sure exactly how many more people it will attract, although they said it would certainly make it easier for people to get here. Actually, Sue reckoned the expansion would damage tourism because people won't want to go on holiday anywhere near an airport. They said that a growing number of people in the local area supported the expansion, particularly local business. But what about the noise? Mr. Kelly said the airport had carried out trial flights last month and no complaints had been received from people in the village. He convinced me that noise wouldn't be a problem for us. Hmm. And what were the airport people like? Well, I expected them to be confrontational, but in fact, they seemed quite understanding of the complaints. They promised to keep us informed about future developments. They say they'll be putting copies of the plans in the village hall. They encouraged us to go there and look at the plans in detail. They also announced that there would be a public inquiry before any final decision is taken. I'm worried about the nuclear power station on the coast. Won't planes fly directly over it? And if ever a plane crashed into it, it would be a disaster. They said that the flight paths they're proposing would keep planes away from the power station. Mind you, when Sue gave her presentation, she warned us that the airport authorities were not telling the truth. She obviously doesn't trust them and demanded that we be shown the details of the flight paths. She wanted to know why we should believe them when they had denied for years that they wanted to expand. They avoided replying to that. And what does the No to Airport Expansion Group want to happen next? Well, we had a talk about that after the meeting. Someone asked Sue what we should do to protest about the proposal and she advised us to write to our local politicians with our objections and she also suggested inviting the Minister for Transport to hear our complaints. I volunteered to write to her and I'm going to go and have a look at the plans. Do you want to come with me? Yes, it'd be interesting to see. Unit 19. Exam practice. Listening, part 4. You will hear five short extracts in which people are talking about moving from the countryside to the city. Look at task 1. For questions 1 to 5, choose from the list A to H the reason each speaker gives for leaving the countryside. Now look at task 2. For questions 6 to 10, choose from the list A to H what each speaker says about their experience of living in the city. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. Speaker 1 I grew up in a village and went to school by bus in a small town just a few miles away. Then after school, I got part-time jobs doing seasonal farming work and stacking shelves in local shops, but nothing permanent. There just weren't many employment opportunities around. So a few years back, I decided to move into the city. It was a big upheaval, you know, leaving family and friends but it was pretty straightforward to get a job and it was reassuring to find how sociable people are. I've met a lot of people with similar interests. I'm out most nights with someone or other. I think everyone should try city life, even if it's only for a short time. Speaker 2 My parents moved out of the city while I was away at university. Then when I finished my course, I went to stay with them. I set up an online business, so it didn't matter where I lived. The countryside was great, but it was a long trek to get to the nearest town to see a film or go to the theatre. So after a year or so, I moved here into the city, where things like that are easy to get to. I'm not really into cooking, so I go out a couple of nights a week to a restaurant or pick up something from a fast food place. It's great that there's a huge range of food on offer. Speaker 3 What surprised me most about living in the city 
is the incredible variety of nationalities that you see around you. It's mind-blowing, all the shops and cultural activities of all the different ethnic groups. Certainly a big change from where I was before. For most of my life, I lived in the same small town, not much more than a village, really, that I was born in. I was very happy there. I worked in a timber business that my father ran, but by the time I was in my mid-twenties, most of my close friends, the people I'd grown up with, had gone away to the capital or one of the other big cities. So I decided it was time for me to move on to. Speaker 4 I lived in a village close to the sea for about ten years. I loved being able to walk along the beach. But what drove me away was the difficulty of finding good accommodation. There were plenty of places to buy or rent, but most were old, cold and damp. I had to come to the city to find something decent within my price range. Admittedly, I have to live a long way out of the centre and commute, but it's great that the buses and trains are frequent and reliable. That's certainly one of the bonuses of living in a built-up area. I miss the peace and quiet, of course, but I think my quality of life is better. Speaker 5 My old place was a few kilometres from the nearest town. I don't drive, so I was dependent on the local bus service, which was useless. You could never guarantee it would be on time, and sometimes it didn't turn up at all. I'm not as young as I was, so a couple of years ago I moved into the city. It hasn't all been plain sailing. It's taken me a while to get used to the crowds and traffic. But at least it's reassuring to know that if I have an accident or I'm suddenly taken ill, there are excellent medical facilities not far away. And I still go back and see friends where I used to live every few weeks. Now listen to part four again. Unit 20. Are you still using the computer? I won't be long. I was just looking at some of these adventure holidays in Australia. You've been to Australia, haven't you? Who did you go with? A company called Transworld Adventures. Oh, that's who I was thinking of going with. They do diving holidays in quite a few places. Perth, Brisbane, Sydney. I went for the one based in Brisbane. It was a fantastic experience. Ah, the website's a bit short on detail, though. What happened when you got there? Who met you at the airport? One of the local organisers did. And then he drove me to a diving school just outside the city, where I met the others in the group. We had a week there learning to dive, and then we went to the Gold Coast, where we had a week of sailing. Do they provide all the equipment? It doesn't say much about that on the website. They should do. They certainly did for us. All the air tanks, weights and things that you need. Although it's useful to have your own face mask and snorkel. Hmm. I'm a bit concerned about the diving. I'm not really a very good swimmer. No, neither am I. But you don't have to be. That's the great thing about diving. You don't actually have to be a strong swimmer. What else were you thinking of doing? Well, sailing would be great, but I've never sailed a boat before. That doesn't matter, nor had I. But it's really not that difficult, and the instructors are brilliant. And anyway, it doesn't matter if you fall in. The water's warm, and they give you life jackets to wear. You think I'd enjoy it then? Oh, I'm sure you would. So, have you got any good tips? Well, make sure you take a sun hat. It's easy to get burned. And take a couple of pairs of old trainers, preferably plastic ones because they get really wet on the boats. I took leather trainers that fell apart and I had to buy new ones while I was out there. I suppose the other thing is that I didn't realise what hard work sailing is. By the end of the holiday, I was exhausted, but very fit. Yes, I need to get into better shape. I was also thinking about spending an extra week in Tasmania going river rafting. That's probably hard work too. Sounds great, but I don't think Transworld Adventures do that, do they? Yeah, it mentions it here on their website. Let's see. So it does. That's new. It looks amazing. You travel down the Franklin River in a rubber dinghy and then camp by the river at night. Wow! Well, if you're going camping, don't forget to take a really good insect repellent. You'll certainly need some. Tea tree oil works very well. What about other camping equipment? A tent and cooking things. Do you think I'll need to take those? I don't imagine so. Usually they provide that sort of stuff. But why not contact them and ask them for more information? Yeah, maybe I'll email them now. 
Unit 20. Exam Practice. Listening, Part 3. You will hear part of a radio interview in which David Evans, a chef in a British school, is talking about his work. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. Today I'm talking to David Evans, who's a school chef at Academy School in Wales. Now, David, this is a new school, isn't it? And it takes a rather unusual approach to school meals. That's right. When the school opened about this time last year, the new principal proposed that school dinners should be compulsory. Some people thought she'd be crazy to go ahead with a plan, but she was determined to. Obviously, this was quite a risky experiment. Students aren't allowed to bring in sandwiches or fizzy drinks, and each day there are only two options available, one vegetarian. We try to introduce a wide range of styles of cooking. Naturally, at first, students were a little dubious about the food. Most had only eaten what you might call traditional British food, so I think it was quite adventurous for them to try what they saw as unusual, the kinds of foods they normally wouldn't have the opportunity to eat at home or wouldn't want to. Mm. And rather than having a typical school canteen with individual students lining up to collect food from the kitchen, you have a different arrangement. Yes, we have our restaurant system. We get everybody seated at about 12.30 on tables of six, and then one student from each table collects the food from the kitchen and serves it to the others. Mm. It's slow, but we deliberately encourage students to sit and talk around the table, including about the food they're eating. <laughs> There's still some resistance to this, particularly as a lot of our students come from homes where fast food and ready meals are what's normally eaten, and family members eat at different times. They don't have the habits of conversation over a meal or discussions about food, but we see this as part of our mission, to give them basic social skills so they can operate in an adult world. And what about staff here? What's their part in this? Staff are expected to eat in the restaurant and sit with students, but they're not there to control things. They're there to talk to students about the food they're eating and, in this way, they learn about nutrition and how important it is to get the right amounts and that having too much carbohydrate or fat isn't a good thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not all food talk. An unexpected benefit is that the teachers learn more about students outside the classroom. At first, there were grumbles from teachers about being forced to eat with students rather than sitting with other members of staff, but now I think they prefer to. <laughs> and you always try to cook with fresh ingredients. Yes, that's right. Although we offer international dishes, both for nutritional reasons and because of environmental concerns, pretty much all of the produce we use is locally sourced. Mm. We've also got a small herb garden behind the science block. <laughs> Students can help with this if they're willing to. So, as well as having fresh food, we're reducing the environmental problems associated with transporting food over long distances. We put up a map in the restaurant to show where food has come from. It's not always possible to get local produce, of course, but uh, we do what we can. Now, what about you personally, David? How did you come to take on the post of school chef here? Well, I've had a varied career. <laughs> I've been a waiter and a chef in a London restaurant. I've run two small companies and I went on to train as a teacher. I taught domestic science in a secondary school for 10 years before taking on this job. I found that probably the most important part of the job is to listen to what the students say about the food. I spend a lot of time in the restaurant. I go and talk to the students. They'll always give me an honest opinion on whether or not they've enjoyed something. The time I spent in management has helped me most with this. You need to listen to what people are saying to get the best out of them and make the right decisions. Mm. And do you think the approach to food you've taken here could be adopted in any school? Uh, no, I don't think all schools would be able to. We're lucky in that we're a new school and we set it up with the ethos that learning about healthy eating is an important life skill and students and their parents accept that, although sometimes rather unwillingly. It could be difficult to introduce this into an established school where, for example, uh, chips and burgers are a regular feature of school dinners. 
Introducing a radical change when students are used to doing things in a certain way can be difficult, but any school could take some steps to make students aware of the importance of healthy eating. I'd certainly advise them to. Over time, I think we'll see most schools moving in this direction. Now listen to part three again. Unit 21. The final presentation to be made tonight is an award for lifetime service to music education, and I'm delighted to say that this goes to Maria Adams. Before I ask Maria to come up and accept the award, I'd just like to say a few words about her. All of you will know of her achievements, first as a highly successful violinist and then as conductor of the York City Orchestra, but fewer of you will know about her contribution to music education in this country and beyond. It was in the mid-1990s that we first met. She had been conductor of the YCO for about a year and I was head of education on York City Council. For some time, Maria had been writing to me, saying that the council should do more to help children's musical development in the city, particularly for those who came from poorer backgrounds. What she was suggesting was that members of the YCO would volunteer their services, either individually or in groups, to go into schools and play for children and run music workshops. In exchange, she wanted the city council to lend instruments to children and provide free music lessons for children whose parents weren't able to afford them. This was at a time when the government had cut funding for music lessons. Eventually, I invited her to talk to the committee, so along she came to present her proposal. What she did first was convince us of the value of a musical education. Making music she sees as a fundamental part of a child's development, as essential as an ability to read or write. What impressed us most was the way she calmly and clearly argued her case. By the end of the meeting, all of us had been won over by Maria's arguments and the Music in Schools project was born. Somehow we found the money to support it. Rarely have I met anyone with such passion for their beliefs. And thanks to Maria's enthusiasm, the project has been a tremendous success. Not only has she persuaded YCO members to give up their time willingly, but she's also encouraged visiting musicians to give free concerts in schools when they come to play in the city. Well, encourage perhaps isn't the right word. She's a very persuasive person. A number of times, the council has tried to make changes to the Music in Schools project in order to save money. When this has happened, Maria has demonstrated that she is a determined and persuasive character. Five years ago, for example, there were plans to start charging all children for music lessons, but this she resisted. Only after Maria threatened to withdraw her support from the project did the council back down. Maria's dream was always to extend her work beyond this city, and with typical energy, she set about persuading the government to adopt the project throughout the country. What's happened as a consequence is that music has become established as an important part of the national curriculum. I think it's fair to say that, had Maria not been around, music education in most schools in this country would have practically disappeared. Instead, so successful has it been that those involved in music education around the world have visited the city to see the project in action. And then came an invitation to be a special advisor to the government on music education. In this role, she's worked closely with the Minister for the Arts. Were he here tonight, I know that he would want to express his thanks personally to Maria. And as a further acknowledgement of her enormous service to music education, we'd like to present her with this Lifetime Achievement Award. Maria Adams, if you'd like to come up onto the stage. Unit 22. People living close to Lake Tal on the island of Luzon in the Philippines continue to be evacuated from the area as the Tal volcano threatens to erupt. Over to our reporter, Katie Hill. Lake Tal lies in the huge crater of the Tal volcano. In the middle of the lake is a smaller volcano which has been showing signs of increased activity over the last few weeks. Tal is one of the most active volcanoes in the world. 
In 1911, an eruption claimed over a thousand lives, and in 1965, villages on the lakeshore were devastated by falling rocks and huge waves on the lake. Although scientists predicted the 1965 eruption, the authorities failed to warn villagers and the breakdown in communication cost at least a hundred lives. After the disaster of 1965, the government introduced the Tal Emergency Strategy. This involved monitoring the volcano for early signs of an eruption and the drawing up of an evacuation plan. Since that time, however, there has been an increase in the number of people living close to the lake and the government has also encouraged the industrial development of the area. The building of two power stations just a few kilometres away was strongly criticised by environmentalists. In the event of an eruption, these would have to be shut down, possibly for a long period if damage occurs. The closure of the power stations would leave thousands of homes and businesses without electricity. Last month, scientists noticed a sudden rise in the temperature of the lake. There was also a dramatic rise in the level of radon gas in the soil. Their concerns increased with the discovery of thousands of dead fish, apparently killed by acidic volcanic gases rising from the bed of the lake. As a result, they gave a warning that Tal could erupt again at any moment. The authorities took immediate action. The president put government authorities on a state of high alert, saying that the danger of the situation made it necessary to bring in the army to oversee operations. The decision was made to evacuate an area of five kilometres around the entire lake, and two days ago the evacuation of around 30,000 people began. The provision of temporary shelter in a safe location for those displaced is the army's top priority, and it is now estimated that about 25,000 evacuees have arrived at makeshift camps. Conditions in the camps are reasonably comfortable, and there are adequate supplies of food and water. But no one knows here how long they will be away from their homes, or, indeed, if Tal erupts again, whether they will have homes to go back to. All they can do is watch and wait for nature to take its course. Katie Hill in the Philippines. The government has announced that it's going to... Unit 23. So what do you think? It's going to be hard to choose between them, isn't it? Yes, there's so many things to think about. But overall, I prefer the out-of-town apartment, the one in Canley. Well, look, don't rush into a decision. It might help just to run through the pros and cons of each of them again. OK. Well, one obvious factor is price. The town apartment's about a third more expensive than the one in Canley. True, although maybe you could get them to lower the price a bit. It's been on the market for a long time, so they're probably keen to sell it. Yes, and it's obvious why they've been having problems selling it. It hasn't been decorated for years. I couldn't believe it when the agent said the decoration was in good condition. It clearly wasn't. It really shocked me to see how bad it was. I'm sure you could get it decorated quite cheaply. And what about location? Uh, one of the things that worries me about the Canley apartment is that it's about 15 kilometres from there into the centre. Living in town would make it so much easier to get to work. It's certainly an advantage being able to walk to work rather than having a long commute. It would save you a lot of money. Yes, but lots of people work in town and live in Canley, so there's bound to be a regular bus service from there. Didn't the agent say there's a bus stop just outside the apartment block? Well, you'd need to look at the bus timetable to check how long it takes to get into town. Personally, I wouldn't like it if I had to get up at six o'clock in the morning to get to work for nine. Another thing is that if I ever bought a car, there's the problem of parking at the town apartment. There's no special parking area for the apartments, is there? On the other hand, there's a car park behind the Canley apartment block. But you're not likely to be able to afford a car for ages. It struck me that the Canley apartment might be quite noisy with that busy road nearby. But it's in such a great location. There's a lot of open space at the back of the block. It'll be great in summer. And there's that lovely little river that runs nearby. Yes, but I wonder whether it floods in heavy rain. I've heard there have been problems in the past. It's a pity that the Canley apartment is so small. There wasn't much space in the bathroom, was there? Nowhere to store towels and things. And did you notice that in one of the bedrooms there was just a bed, a small wardrobe and some bookshelves? You couldn't even fit a chest of drawers in there. The kitchen was quite small too. I must admit the town apartment is a bit bigger, but the rooms in it are quite dark and that made it feel cramped. 
I really like the light in the Canley apartment. Another thing to consider is whether the apartment is going to be a good investment. Yes, they say that the cost of property in the town centre is going to go up with more people wanting to move in. Apparently, there are plans to build new apartments not far from the one we looked at. Maybe, although the agent's advertisement for the Canley apartment says there is expected to be a lot of interest in the property. Oh, I'm sure it's just a way of encouraging people to buy quickly. But take your time to think about it. There's no hurry to decide. You really want me to take the town apartment, don't you? Well, it's obviously your decision, but there are so many advantages of living in town. Yes, and it would be so much easier for us to come and visit you there. Unit 24 Osman Seville. Oh, hi, Osman. It's Sophia. Look, I'm really sorry, but I've messed up our plans for tomorrow. Oh, no. What's happened? Something's come up at work. Well, to be honest, it's a really important meeting. I'm so silly. I arranged it weeks ago and I forgot to put it in my diary. It means I've got to spend a couple of days in Marseille and I'll be heading off there early tomorrow morning. Right. So I won't be able to pick you up at the airport after all. I tried to reschedule the meeting for next week, but it's just impossible. I'm really, really sorry about this. No, don't worry. I'm sure I'll be able to get to your place somehow. Well, it means that you'll have to get to Perpignan from Montpellier Airport on your own, and I'm afraid it's a bit complicated. You've got to get to Montpellier Railway Station and then catch a train to Perpignan. If you've got a pen handy, you might want to take down some of the information I'm going to give to you. OK, just a second. Right, go ahead. OK, now, I know that you get to Montpellier Airport at 8 in the evening. Ten past eight, that's right. I found out the train times from the SNCF website, and it appears that the last one from Montpellier to Perpignan is at ten minutes to ten. You really need to catch that train, or an earlier one. So the first step is to get from the airport to the railway station in the centre of Montpellier. I know you're on a tight budget, so you could get the bus instead of a taxi. But to be honest, I'd advise you against catching the bus. It can be quite unreliable, and it will only take you as far as the main square, and then it's a bit of a walk to the railway station from there. For the sake of a few euros, it's worth taking a taxi right to the station. Right. OK, I'll do that. You'll need to buy a ticket before you get on the train. I think it costs a about 25 euros. The last train's due to get in at about 11.30. Because I won't be in Perpignan, I've booked you into a hotel not far from the station. That's great, thanks. It's called Le Metropole. I haven't stayed there myself, but one of my friends recommended it to me. Le Metropole, right. That sounds good, thanks. Now, depending on the weather, you could either take a taxi there or walk from the station. Actually, it's probably best to walk, as it's really not far. Don't worry about getting lost. Everyone knows La Metropole, and will be able to give you directions. And there'll still be plenty of people around at that time of night. OK, that's fine. It'll be quite late when you arrive, so when you've checked into the hotel, I suggest you get a meal there. The hotel restaurant is very good, and they'll still be serving food at that time. And have whatever you like. I'm paying for your room and the meal. No, you don't need to do that. Yes, I want to. It's the least I can do. I'll sort out the bill when I pick you up on Thursday afternoon. Well, I'll buy you a meal later in the holiday. All right, then. I'll take you up on that. <laughs> Fine. Relax on Thursday morning and walk around town. Perpignan's a lovely place. While you're strolling around, look out for Café Mathis. You might want to try their hot chocolate. It's the best in town. I should be with you at about two, and I'll meet you in the foyer at La Metropole. Sounds wonderful. Thanks for organising that. I'm looking forward to seeing you. OK, Osman. And I'm really sorry again. Hope the journey goes well, and I'll see you on Thursday. Great. See you then. Bye, Sophia. Unit 24. Exam Practice. Listening, Part 1. You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer, A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. 
you hear two friends talking about doing team sports in the schools they went to. You did a lot of team sports at school, didn't you? Yes, mainly football and volleyball. I was in the school team for both of them. I always felt really healthy from it, and it was a great way of getting to know people well. Some of the people I played with are still people I meet up with regularly. But you were good at sport too, weren't you? Didn't you enjoy it? To be honest, I really didn't like team sports at school, although I did play rugby. It certainly kept me in good shape, but what I disliked most was having to spend so much time on it after school. All I really wanted to do was get on with homework, which I actually enjoyed, but the rugby practice got in the way. I also hated the competitive side, the constant pressure to win. I've spoken to some teammates since then, still people I keep in touch with, and many of them felt the same way. Well, I suppose the pressure is sometimes a bit intense, but overall, I think doing team sports can really help you develop skills that are useful in later life. I suppose I'm a naturally competitive person, and I got a lot of fun out of playing against teams from other schools. You did a lot of team sports at school, didn't you? Yes, mainly football and volleyball. I was in the school team for both of them. I always felt really healthy from it, and it was a great way of getting to know people well. Some of the people I played with are still people I meet up with regularly. But you were good at sport too, weren't you? Didn't you enjoy it? To be honest, I really didn't like team sports at school, although I did play rugby. It certainly kept me in good shape, but what I disliked most was having to spend so much time on it after school. All I really wanted to do was get on with homework, which I actually enjoyed, but the rugby practice got in the way. I also hated the competitive side, the constant pressure to win. I've spoken to some teammates since then, still people I keep in touch with, and many of them felt the same way. Well, I suppose the pressure is sometimes a bit intense. But overall, I think doing team sports can really help you develop skills that are useful in later life. I suppose I'm a naturally competitive person, and I got a lot of fun out of playing against teams from other schools. Extract 2. You hear two friends talking about reading. I noticed one of your friends gave you an e-reader for your birthday, but I haven't seen you use it yet. No, I've hardly used it at all. I still prefer reading printed books. Oh, but e-readers are so convenient. You should really try it more. I use mine all the time, on the train, on the way to work, on holiday, reading in bed before I go to sleep. You read a lot, don't you? You'd be able to carry a load of reading material around with you in something that's the size of a single paperback. Mm. And it's not just books. You can get newspapers and magazines as well. What I particularly like is being able to change the font size so easily. I hate reading books with very small print. Have a go. Yes, that's all very true, but I just like holding real books. There's something about how they feel, and sometimes even how they smell, that really appeals. And I like having them on my bookshelves to remind me what I've read as I walk past them. And also to show people who visit what I've read so they can learn something about me. You can't do that if what you've read is on an e-reader. I noticed one of your friends gave you an e-reader for your birthday, but I haven't seen you use it yet. No, I've hardly used it at all. I still prefer reading printed books. Oh, but e-readers are so convenient. You should really try it more. I use mine all the time, on the train, on the way to work, on holiday, reading in bed before I go to sleep. You read a lot, don't you? You'd be able to carry a load of reading material around with you in something that's the size of a single paperback. Mm. And it's not just books. You can get newspapers and magazines as well. What I particularly like is being able to change the font size so easily. I hate reading books with very small print. Have a go. Yes, that's all very true, but I just like holding real books. There's something about how they feel, and sometimes even how they smell, that really appeals.
And I like having them on my bookshelves to remind me what I've read as I walk past them. And also to show people who visit what I've read so they can learn something about me. You can't do that if what you've read is on an e-reader. Extract 3. You hear two people talking about receiving marketing texts on mobile phones. You've got a new job in your company, haven't you? Yes, I transferred to the marketing department just a couple of weeks ago. My job's to send texts to people about new offers and new products. Oh, I get marketing texts all the time, and I must say that I find it pretty irritating. They tend to come from companies I know nothing about, trying to sell me things I've no wish to own. Although I sometimes text back telling them to stop contacting me, the texts just keep coming. I mean, I can understand why companies do it. It's a really efficient way of keeping people informed, but I wish I could stop it somehow. Well, our company just sends texts to people who we think would want to find out more about our products. Perhaps they've already bought something from us online, so we know they might be interested in hearing from us. They'll have given us permission to send them details as well. And if people tell us to stop contacting them, we always delete their details from our database. Of course, not all companies follow the regulations that have been agreed about marketing texts. You've got a new job in your company, haven't you? Yes, I transferred to the marketing department just a couple of weeks ago. My job's to send texts to people about new offers and new products. Oh, I get marketing texts all the time, and I must say that I find it pretty irritating. They tend to come from companies I know nothing about, trying to sell me things I've no wish to own. Although I sometimes text back telling them to stop contacting me, the texts just keep coming. I mean... I can understand why companies do it. It's a really efficient way of keeping people informed, but I wish I could stop it somehow. Well, our company just sends texts to people who we think would want to find out more about our products. Perhaps they've already bought something from us online, so we know they might be interested in hearing from us. They'll have given us permission to send them details as well. And if people tell us to stop contacting them, we always delete their details from our database. Of course... Not all companies follow the regulations that have been agreed about marketing texts. Unit 25 Thanks, Kate, for showing us happening. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions about it from students. Sarah, yes, you first. Where did your idea of a newspaper for teenagers come from? Well, I used to spend a lot of time reading newspapers when I was at school, but my friends didn't read them much, even though I knew they were concerned about what was going on in the world. So I suppose the idea of setting up some kind of newspaper for young people came from that time. Anna, why did you go for an online newspaper? Well, I did a journalism course at university. I'd also had the opportunity to do a course on website design, and that influenced my decision. It just seemed natural to combine the two, so I designed a prototype of an online newspaper for teens. My main motivation was that I wanted to increase young people's awareness of current affairs, but I also realised that there might be a chance of making it a commercial success. I felt that there was a big demand for an online newspaper aimed specifically at teenagers. Jasvinda, your question. Didn't you need a lot of money to get it started? Not really, no. I talked to a couple of university friends, and when the course finished, we just went ahead. That's one of the great things about most online business. You don't need huge amounts of money at the outset. But we did need money to live on, of course. We had real difficulty in persuading banks to lend us anything at all. Every bank we approached was sceptical about whether the project would ever make money. But eventually, we managed to borrow some money from parents, and we took the decision to work on it for six months. If we weren't making money after that, we'd give the idea up. Can I ask a question here? How do you actually make money when people don't have to pay to access the site? All the money comes from advertising. Organisations pay us to put their adverts on the site. When we started, we immediately contacted companies, but it was difficult to generate business at first. They were very wary of advertising with us, but as the number of hits we got started to increase... That's the number of people accessing the site. The number of companies wanting advertising space went up as well. I see. Thanks. Uh, Hannah, you've got another question. Do you think online newspapers will ever take the place of traditional newspapers? I doubt it. 
Being able to access news online is right for some people, but not others. A lot of people want to be able to read a newspaper on the bus or train, or at home away from their computer. So no, I think there will always be a need for traditional newspapers. Any more? Tom? What's been the reaction of teenagers to happening? We average about 20,000 hits a day, and the number's steadily growing. We've had an increase of about 50% in the last three months alone. When I talk to young people, they seem generally very enthusiastic about the site, and hundreds of comments get posted on our message board each day. And do many people complain about happening? Yes, we get both complaints and praise. In the early days, we used to get quite a lot of complaints about our news coverage because it didn't feature young people's perspectives enough. We've tried to take that on board. So, for example, as you know, a recent big news story has been the protests about the location of a new nuclear power station on the East Coast. As part of this, we covered what school students had been doing to protest. We also occasionally get complaints about how well the website works. Young people demand very high standards nowadays. Hannah? Are any young people directly involved in producing happening? Yes, young people get the chance to contribute in various ways. For example, we have a review section which is concerned with films, CDs, DVDs and books. All of the reviews are written by young people. And what future do you see for happening? That's a good question. First, I'd like to see it expanding. We've decided to include a section on celebrities and also do more on science and technology. For that, though, we need more staff, and that means more money. But the recent increase in hits on the website means that we can charge more for advertising space. So we're quite optimistic about that. More generally, though, politicians seem to be getting interested in happening as a place where young people express their views. If I'm right about this, then young people may be able to have an influence on government policies through happening. Interesting. Jerry, you've got a question. Unit 26. I grew up in a quiet, remote, rural area, but I've lived here in the heart of the city since I was a student. The traffic and the noise don't bother me. I just love all the hustle and bustle. I work at one of the top art galleries, a ten-minute walk from here. In my work and my social life, I come into regular contact with people from all over the world. It's really interesting. And being here, you just take for granted the incredible range of entertainment on offer. Theatres, cinemas, nightclubs, concerts of all kinds. As far as I'm concerned, the only downside is the cost of living. My rent's nearly twice what it would be if I moved to a smaller town. The nearest I came to living in a big city was spending two weeks at the home of an old school friend. Her parents own a flat in the centre of London. It was really convenient, just being able to hop on a bus or take the underground. At first it gave me quite a buzz, being somewhere where so much was going on, but I don't think I relaxed the whole time I was there. What got to me was the constant noise all day and all night. I also felt a bit nervous if I was out on my own, especially at night. Perhaps it was a subconscious awareness that crime rates are higher in cities than in rural areas. It was a real relief to get home. Unit 27 Start with yourself and work backwards. Write down as much information as you already have about your parents, your grandparents, and your grandparents' parents. Verify your facts as you go. Talk to your relatives. Ask your oldest relatives for their memories of the family. Then move on to younger ones who may have heard stories about your Irish roots. Start with some clearly focused questions, but allow your relatives to reminisce freely. Find your ancestor's place of origin in Ireland. For many family historians, this can be the biggest hurdle to connecting with their Irish roots. If you already know the town where your ancestors used to live, start digging there. Deal only with facts. Family legends are rarely 100% accurate. The ancestral farm may have been a simple cottage with a few square meters of garden outside. 
Tales of selfless kindness have probably been much embellished over the years. While there is often at least a grain of truth to these stories, they should not dictate the entire course of your research into your Irish roots. Be prepared. You are likely to find one or two skeletons in the cupboard. Except that the truth may be somewhat less attractive than its telling in family tales. And be honest in your recording. Develop a research plan. You have two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents, and so on. You have to draw the line somewhere. It's traditional to follow the male line from your father and the female line from your mother, but it's entirely up to you. Choose just one branch of your roots to study for now. Record your data. You're going to accumulate huge amounts of information from a variety of sources and will soon find it impossible to retain it all in your head. Get in the habit of carefully recording every piece of new data as you uncover it. Don't be too ambitious. For the majority, this search for our Irish roots leads us to poor, landless laborers. As such, their lives were not well documented, and where records survive, they are unlikely to date from much before 1800 at best. Unit 28. Speaker 1. It was the second time I'd seen Hot Club of Cowtown, and I can honestly say it was one of the best live music events I've ever been to. The venue was pretty ordinary, a small provincial theatre, but when they're playing, you forget your surroundings and just rock out with the band. What I just love about this band, apart from their high energy, is that they play their rather eclectic mix of material without a hint of irony. You should try and see them while they're over from the US. They're gaining a devoted following. Speaker 2 I've never been a great fan of stand-up, but one of my friends had got a spare ticket for this gig. He wasn't someone I'd heard of before, and it was in a run-down local club, so I wasn't really expecting much. As it turned out, I can't remember the last time I laughed so much. He had the whole audience in stitches from the moment he came on stage. Speaker 3. It's one of the most unusual exhibitions I've ever seen. In fact, I'm not even sure exhibition is the right word. For a start, it's in a field near Salisbury, not in a gallery. And it's a collection of weird and wonderful shapes, about 50 in total, made in the ground in the middle of a wheat field. The amazing thing is that all the shapes are perfectly formed, and there are no other marks in the wheat, but they were made entirely by hand. Unit 29 Do you fantasise about a new life on the other side of the world, where everything is exciting and the dreary routine of home is a million miles away? Lots of people do. The dream of pastures new is realised by thousands of Brits every year, but the downside is that, however wonderful your new surroundings, it's likely that you'll pine for some aspect of home. 35-year-old Jane Foreman knows all about the pain of homesickness. Her husband David's job took her to Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia a year and a half ago, but she is desperate to return home to Annick in Northumberland. Unit 29 We've managed to find a pretty strong expat community out here, but I still feel homesick most of the time. I miss my family and friends desperately, the daily contact with people I've known all my life. As a family, we're very close-knit, always on the telephone or popping round for this and that. I definitely feel I've lost more than many by moving here. After 18 months, we still haven't found our feet, and I'm starting to feel like it will be impossible to really settle. If you look at it logically, KL is a far more exciting place to live. It's multicultural, there are amazing places to eat and drink, it's one of the best cities in Asia for shopping, and it's summer all year round. By contrast, Annick is pretty dull really, but my heart's in Northumberland. We would be home like a shot if it wasn't for David's job. Severe homesickness like Jane's is difficult to overcome, but it can be done. 
Louisa Stevenson, a 32-year-old environmental engineer from Sheffield, initially regretted her decision to emigrate to Canada. But after six months, she says she's happier than ever before. In the past, I've travelled a fair bit, and I'd always been one for going off the beaten track. I spent a year as a volunteer in Tanzania and another year in Indonesia. I'd also spent several holidays here in Vancouver with my fiancé's family. None of this prepared me for the sense of loss that overwhelmed me on arrival, though. It was like a rug being pulled out from under my feet. I didn't know anyone. Obviously, my in-laws and my fiancé were here, but compared to Sheffield... All the familiar faces were gone for good. I felt very insecure. Somebody once told me that homesickness is similar to the grieving process. I can believe that now. That's past, though, and things are looking up. The wedding helped. I met so many of Jason's friends. Then I joined a local Thai kickboxing class. The teachers at the centre are lovely, welcoming people. And just last week, I found out that I'm going to have a baby. Kickboxing may be off the menu for a while, but right now, emigrating to Canada feels like the best decision I ever made. Unit 29. Exam Practice. Listening Part 2. You will hear Lindsay Jones, a recent graduate, talking to a group of students about travelling abroad to find work. For questions 1 to 8, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. After months of searching for work since graduating from university last summer, I've decided to move to New Zealand and leave Britain's jobless economy behind me. Online statistics have shown that I'm not the only one. 10,000 or so people leave Britain annually for New Zealand, plus many more head to Australia or Canada, as well as less traditional destinations for emigrants, such as Germany and Singapore. Despite being a graduate with a good degree from a highly respected university, the only available jobs that I could have applied for in Britain were general low-level jobs, ones where experience wasn't an issue and which definitely weren't suitable for a graduate. That being the case, I decided that if I was going to have to work in a shop or as a hotel receptionist, I might as well do it in a different country and as part of a new experience. That's why I'm heading to New Zealand next month, equipped with a working holiday visa, though I'm hoping that it won't take me too long to find a proper job. Few of my old university friends have had much luck finding work at home either, and I can only think of one person who has actually got what I would call a real graduate-level job. I'm really hoping that working in a country with a stronger economy will give graduates like me new life skills and experiences that may help us land a better job when we return to the UK. I guess a lucky few might also find well-paid graduate jobs in their chosen country, but I know that I can't count on that. Last year, an older friend of mine arrived in New Zealand with what she thought was plenty of money in case she didn't find work. But accommodation costs and food are both higher than in Britain, and jobs are not easy to find. She has already returned home and warned me against being over-optimistic about finding work. But anything's better than sitting around waiting for a job to appear out of nowhere, so I'm determined to give it a go, and not to let her put me off. I've made my own arrangements and I'm heading out alone. I could have asked travel agencies who offer services for young travellers and students like me to help me put together a visa, set up a bank account, as well as find accommodation for me in New Zealand. Another friend of mine called Lucy, who's a couple of years older than me, has spent a whole year in Australia, and her stay was partly organised by a travel company. She started off in Sydney and worked in a restaurant as a waitress for a few months, which gave her the chance to see the city through the eyes of a local resident. Later, she moved to Melbourne, where she worked in a bar, before moving on to a clothes shop in Brisbane. She really loved feeling part of a community rather than being just another young British student passing through. The experience has really boosted her confidence, and she's hoping that this will be enough to make her stand out when she competes for jobs with thousands of other graduates when she returns home. Only time will tell if this strategy pays off, but I'd recommend anyone to try this route if they find themselves in a similar situation. I, for one, am determined to make the most of this opportunity. Now listen to part two again. Unit 30. 
A US study published recently set out to determine why people take risks. It came to the conclusion that risk and age are correlated. The researchers sampled 500 participants, divided into four main groups – children, adolescents, young adults and the elderly, further dividing them into certain social backgrounds and also by gender. The methodology required participants to resolve a situation by choosing one of two options. One option was safer than the other, but would result in a worse outcome than taking the potentially riskier option. Participants were told that 600 coins were locked in a box that could be opened in one of two ways. The first option would guarantee that 200 coins in the box would be saved a 66% loss, and the second option had a one-third chance of saving all 600 coins, but a two-thirds chance of breaking the box and losing all of the coins. The results showed that social background was not a significant predictor of risk avoidance, with each social group just as likely as the others to pick the so-called safe option. Gender was also a relatively minor predictor of a preference to engage in risk-taking, although male participants were slightly more likely to take the riskier option than their female counterparts. The results also show that the most significant predictor of risky behaviour was age, with adolescents more likely to display risk-taking behaviour, often for the thrill of it, than either children, young adults or the elderly. The authors of the study are satisfied these results are proof that risk-taking and the onset of adolescence are linked. Children's responses showed far more fear of risky situations, and the elderly participants in the study tended to be more sensible, foreseeing problems when presented with a risky option, especially where money was concerned. Unit 31 when I moved to England from the States, it was one of the first things I noticed. I found it quite shocking to see grown women call themselves girls, and to allow themselves to be called girls. A girl is someone who is not an adult, not a grown-up, is not someone who takes responsibility for herself. She's a child. When you get past a certain age, as a mature adult, you do not want to be treated as a child. In comparison to men, women are still underpaid in Western culture and are striving to make inroads into a male-dominated society. We should pay attention to the way women are addressed, especially in the workplace, and whether the word girl is used in a derogatory way or not. Of course, the same applies to the term boys, but you don't throw that word around as often, and men do not have a historical disadvantage to deal with. Unit 31 Throughout my life I have been involved in gymnastics. I first participated in the sport at the age of three and completed my competitive career at the age of 18. I was a strong and powerful gymnast who did well on the vault and bars, but had more difficulties with the graceful dancing aspect of the balance beam and floor exercise. To me, my larger frame and muscular physique stood out among most other gymnasts who were petite and graceful. However, this did not stop me from pursuing the sport I loved. Before studying the subject, I knew that gymnastics was mainly an individualised sport, but I'd never thought about it being a traditionally female sport. What I've learned from my studies is that gymnastics is deemed a feminine sport, predominantly because it lacks face-to-face -face competition and overt aggression. But with the amazing skills and strength that male gymnasts demonstrate, I can see that we are moving away from this gender typing. Behaviour and participation in the sport seems to be more and more gender neutral, and this encourages both boys and girls to take part. Gymnastics provides wonderful strength and flexibility training for both male and female, so this can only be a good thing for everyone involved. Unit 32 One of the most difficult things about finding employment these days is the impossible situation of not being able to get a job without experience and not being able to get experience without a job. 
I struggled with this after I left school, as did many of my school friends. With the job market the way it is right now, you can't even get a job waiting tables in a restaurant without at least two years' experience and good references, regardless of whether you have recognised qualifications or not. My parents would always tell me that the secret to getting a job was to walk into an office, go straight to the manager, look them in the eye, give them a firm handshake and tell them why you deserved a job. That might have worked in the 70s, but things are different now. One of the ways around this is to apply for an apprenticeship. An apprenticeship gives you hands-on experience in the area you want to work in, and you get paid while you are learning a profession. Nine months after I left school, I was lucky enough to get an apprenticeship as a trainee engineer for a firm in my hometown. I didn't know anything about engineering, but my supervisor offered valuable support and showed me the basics. I received a lot of training in engineering theory and general boat and ship design, as well as a number of health and safety courses before I was ready to enter the workshop for the first time. After this initial insight into the job, I was able to learn more difficult and technical tasks and was soon working on my own. I gained my Master Engineer's Certificate after 12 months of regular classes and training, and six months later I was also given a team of trainees to supervise and team building days to organise. I am now giving something back as an educator after the help my company has given me. I would definitely recommend doing an apprenticeship if you want to learn a trade. The difference it has made to my life and career is amazing. Unit 33 Smallpox was a highly infectious disease that entered the body through the skin and resulted in symptoms such as fever and spots that could spread across the entire body, leading to scarring of the face, blindness, abnormal growths to the arms and legs, and often death. Smallpox was a devastating disease which affected an estimated 300 million people during the 20th century alone. However, thanks to a successful immunisation programme that began as far back as the 1700s, the disease was successfully beaten worldwide by the end of the 1970s. The immunisation procedure involved using a vaccine, a substance that contained a harmless form of the virus which is given to a person or animal and that improves immunity to a particular disease. This vaccine was given to patients via an injection to the arm or leg, with the vast majority of people having this vaccine as children, some as young as two months old. The smallpox vaccination procedure was developed by an English doctor named Edward Jenner in the late 18th century, who had noticed that farm labourers who had caught the animal form of smallpox, cowpox, didn't go on to catch the human form. As a result, Jenner used the cowpox virus to develop a vaccine, a cure against the spread of smallpox in humans. Much later, by 1950, the Pan American Health Organization had successfully put an end to the disease in the majority of the Western world through an international immunization program. In 1959, the World Health Assembly decided to take steps to defeat smallpox globally. The last recorded case of smallpox was in 1977 in Somalia, and soon after, the disease was declared to have totally disappeared from every country. Unit 34 Cycling is a great way to get to know a city, and at the same time, to keep fit. There are many amazing cities for biking throughout the world, cities which allow you to explore at ease and safely. Today, you are going to hear about three bike-friendly cities. Let's start with Amsterdam, which is known as the bike capital of the world. According to the latest statistics, 40% of all traffic movements in the city are by bicycle. The city has an extensive network of safe, fast cycle lanes, as well as a highly effective theft prevention program. Residents or visitors can also rent bicycles. The city council is currently planning a 10,000 bike garage at the main train station. Portland, the second most bike-friendly city in the world, has a bicycle network that connects all parts of the city. This has led to a dramatic increase in bicycle use in the city. The city was also the first in the States to provide adults on low incomes with commuter bicycles as well as lessons on commuting safely. 
The bikes are all fitted with lights, a lock, a helmet, a pump, toolkits, maps, and rainwear. In some neighborhoods, bike commuters are as high as 9%. Copenhagen, the capital of Denmark, is home to the world's most successful community cycling program. In Denmark, almost everybody has a bike, and currently 32% of workers cycle to work. Most of the city's extensive and well used bicycle paths are separated from the main traffic lanes and sometimes have their own signal systems. Already, one neighborhood is completely car free. The city provides public bicycles, which can be found throughout the city center and used with a returnable deposit of 20 kroner. Your money is refunded when you return the bike to one of the many racks. Unit 34 Exam Practice Listening Part 1. You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1 You hear a woman asking her friend about a change in his transport habits. What's happened to you? You never used to walk anywhere. I know, but now I've turned over a new leaf. I don't believe it. You always used to get us to drive you everywhere, even when you could have caught a bus or a train. Yeah, well, a couple of weeks ago, just about everyone seemed to be away and I had to get taxis every day. You know, I have no idea about public transport. Even though I was often just travelling very short distances, it was costing me an absolute fortune. One night, it was really late and I got fed up of waiting for a taxi. So I walked home. It only took me about 10 minutes longer than it would have taken me by taxi. I really felt quite pleased with myself because I'd saved the price of a pizza. I realised that there were a lot of better things I could be doing with my cash than blowing it on taxis. Why don't you buy yourself a car? Yeah, you're right. Actually, I've started taking driving lessons and I'm saving what I would have spent on taxi fares. Eventually, I'll be able to afford my own car. In the meantime, I'm enjoying walking. It's really good exercise. What's happened to you? You never used to walk anywhere. I know, but now I've turned over a new leaf. I don't believe it. You always used to get us to drive you everywhere, even when you could have caught a bus or a train. Yeah, well, a couple of weeks ago, just about everyone seemed to be away and I had to get taxis every day. You know, I have no idea about public transport. Even though I was often just travelling very short distances, it was costing me an absolute fortune. One night, it was really late, and I got fed up of waiting for a taxi. So I walked home. It only took me about 10 minutes longer than it would have taken me by taxi. I really felt quite pleased with myself because I'd saved the price of a pizza. I realised that there were a lot of better things I could be doing with my cash than blowing it on taxis. Why don't you buy yourself a car? Yeah, you're right. Actually, I've started taking driving lessons, and I'm saving what I would have spent on taxi fares. Eventually, I'll be able to afford my own car. In the meantime, I'm enjoying walking. It's really good exercise. Extract 2. You hear two people talking about flying. So, how did it all start? Well, it got really bad after a flight to France. It was a small plane and the weather wasn't wonderful, but it was only a 55 minute flight. And what happened? Well, takeoff was a bit wobbly, and as we got higher, it started to get really bumpy. When the pilot started speaking, I thought he was going to tell us to prepare for an emergency landing, and I started to panic. As it turned out, all he said was that the flight was going to be a bit rough because of turbulence. But that didn't help? No, not really. I thought he was just saying that to stop everyone panicking. But nobody else was panicking. They were taking the whole incident very calmly. It was then that I realised I had a problem. Hmm. And you always get like this in the airport? Well, I just feel a bit apprehensive now. That's natural, isn't it? My hands are a bit sweaty, I suppose. I guarantee you, on the plane, I'll feel absolutely sick with nerves when the engine starts up. But landing is a massive relief to me, which is the bit most people find scary. So, how did it all start? 
Well, it got really bad after a flight to France. It was a small plane and the weather wasn't wonderful, but it was only a 55-minute flight. And what happened? Well, takeoff was a bit wobbly, and as we got higher, it started to get really bumpy. When the pilot started speaking, I thought he was going to tell us to prepare for an emergency landing, and I started to panic. As it turned out, all he said was that the flight was going to be a bit rough because of turbulence. But that didn't help? No, not really. I thought he was just saying that to stop everyone panicking. But nobody else was panicking. They were taking the whole incident very calmly. It was then that I realised I had a problem. Hmm. And you always get like this in the airport? Well, I just feel a bit apprehensive now. That's natural, isn't it? My hands are a bit sweaty, I suppose. I guarantee you, on the plane, I'll feel absolutely sick with nerves when the engine starts up. But landing is a massive relief to me, which is the bit most people find scary. Extract 3 You hear part of an interview with a man who is talking about travelling on the London Underground. Do you remember the first time you went on an underground train? Yeah, I was about five, I think. I remember it was my first time in London. I didn't have the faintest idea what the tube was. I couldn't believe it when we stepped on the escalator and started going down into the ground. That was so thrilling for a little kid. I remember giggling and waving at the people on the up escalator. At one point I got so carried away that I almost toppled, but luckily my dad was holding my hand. On the platform, I remember staring at the black tunnel. Then there was a whooshing noise, a warm wind, and suddenly there was the train. The doors slid open and hundreds of people spilled out. That was the only thing that was a bit scary. Do you still get like that? <laughs> no, I'm pretty blasé now. It's still awe-inspiring, though, when you think about it. All the business types, tourists, clubbers and buskers rushing about in those hot, airless tunnels because it's simply the best way to get from A to B. It's one of the great London institutions. No wonder you see all the merchandise covered in logos and maps on sale everywhere these days. The London Underground has become an icon. Do you remember the first time you went on an underground train? Yeah, I was about five, I think. I remember it was my first time in London. I didn't have the faintest idea what the tube was. I couldn't believe it when we stepped on the escalator and started going down into the ground. That was so thrilling for a little kid. I remember giggling and waving at the people on the up escalator. At one point I got so carried away that I almost toppled, but luckily my dad was holding my hand. On the platform, I remember staring at the black tunnel. Then there was a whooshing noise, a warm wind, and suddenly there was the train. The doors slid open and hundreds of people spilled out. That was the only thing that was a bit scary. Do you still get like that? <laughs> no, I'm pretty blasé now. It's still awe-inspiring, though, when you think about it. All the business types, tourists, clubbers and buskers rushing about in those hot, airless tunnels because it's simply the best way to get from A to B. It's one of the great London institutions. No wonder you see all the merchandise covered in logos and maps on sale everywhere these days. The London Underground has become an icon. Unit 36. Speaker 1. They've got absolutely nothing to do with reality. They're just fantasies for people who've got no life of their own. If they had, they wouldn't waste their time watching these programmes. I just see them more as entertaining game shows. But they're all contests of some kind, whether the prizes are money, love, jobs or whatever. And these game shows are wonderfully entertaining in the same way a great trashy novel feels so good during the summer. We all need to relax and unwind from time to time. And in the world of reality TV, there's something for everybody to enjoy. Speaker 2 Although I'm quite ashamed of it and would never admit it to my friends, I adore reality TV programmes. They're definitely a guilty pleasure for me. I even prefer some of them to normal scripted shows. It seems the drama on these shows is addictive. It's compulsive viewing, like a car crash. You just can't tear your eyes away from it. But I really wish they were more real than they are. 
I don't like the fact that the producers feel the need to reshoot certain scenes or to manipulate storylines. Speaker 3 I love reality TV, although I'm not too sure how much is unscripted, but it is interesting to watch how others react to a new situation, how they work together with other people they've never met, and how they find a way to find common ground with people they would never have spoken to if not brought together by the show. I think group dynamics are fascinating, especially when they're complete strangers. These shows may not be everyone's cup of tea, but I certainly enjoy them. Unit 37 Speaker 1 While I've seen many successful startups with friends and family, I've seen more heartache and failures. The friendships won't last if there is a fallout. I've always been told, never go into business with friends or family. I think that's basically good advice. Our personal relationships are too precious to risk in this way. Speaker 2 What I'd suggest is that you bring in other people from outside your social circle and give them real responsibility. If the strain of cash flow or conflicting goals gets too great, that will give you more of a buffer. And keep things in perspective so that the friendship stays first. Speaker 3 Treat this venture as you would when dealing with strangers, so get everything in writing. I'd strongly advise having each potential partner and their spouses put down what they expect from their participation in the business. Build a comprehensive business plan based in part on these expectations. Also, have an attorney review all contractual agreements. Oh, we're such good friends, we don't need an attorney, we'll never hold up in a court of law. Only a contract holds up. Good luck. Speaker 4 Deciding whether or not to partner with a friend or family member is a tricky question. Businesses are tough. You don't want to mess up your relationship. Consider whether a dispute with your partner would affect your ability to be friends with them and vice versa. If they tend to get pretty emotional in a disagreement, you are probably better off choosing someone else. Unit 37 Exam Practice. Listening, Part 3. You will hear part of a radio interview in which two psychologists, Stella Burrows and Simon Perez, are giving advice to office workers. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. Good afternoon. Today we're looking at ways of getting on well with work colleagues. With me I have Stella Burrows and Simon Perez, both psychologists who have recently published an article on the importance of workplace personalities in the office environment. Stella and Simon, welcome to the programme. Hello. Hi. <laughs> so, what do you mean by workplace personalities? Well, we all know the classic office characters, don't we? I'm talking about the smooth talker with a suit that's a bit too shiny. The terribly efficient but nervous office manager. The person who can be seen dashing around everywhere and gets paid a lot, but no one is quite sure what they actually do. Every person has their own office persona. Are you saying that people behave differently at their place of work from how they do at other times? Yes, that's exactly what we're saying. Your office persona will be slightly or indeed very different from your home life character. If you're a live-to-work type, it's a good idea to think about how your character comes across to your colleagues. Perhaps other people are inspired by your efforts or, on the other hand, they may see you as a goody-goody. Your boss is likely to value the fact that you put so much effort into your work, although they they may have started taking it for granted that you arrive early, stay late and never put a foot wrong. In other words, you may seem too good to be true. That's a live-to-work type. What about the work-to-live type? Obviously, they're very different. In fact, they're quite literally opposite in every way. If you are a work-to-live type, your colleagues may be frustrated that you don't seem to be pulling your weight or they may be fed up of making excuses for your being late. Your boss may secretly be impressed at your lack of interest in joining the rat race, but still be irritated by your lack of commitment and effort. 
But surely these are extreme examples. Well, sure. Most people are not at either of the two extremes we've described. They're probably somewhere in the middle. So we've come up with a number of tips which will help everyone to have a healthier work-life balance and so be a good work colleague. OK, let's have some concrete ideas for our listeners. Well, whatever you do, don't take the credit for someone else's work, especially to try and impress your manager in meetings. Be prepared. Make sure you are up to date with new projects and have plenty of your own ideas. If you're working on a team project, make sure you pull your weight. Don't hide in the group and expect them to carry you. Take your job seriously, regardless of what you do, and other people in your workplace will respect and value their jobs. If you undermine what you do, you are undermining their job too. This is a surefire way to drive your colleagues mad. How about on the more personal front? Do you have any advice there? Well, yes, there are some very simple do's and don'ts that are just common sense. For example, don't gossip about your colleagues behind their backs. And if you can see that one of your colleagues is upset about something, ask if there's anything you can do to help. Also, be very careful about telling other people what you think they should do, unless, of course, they actually ask you for your opinion. You could easily lose colleagues' respect if you appear to be superior. Stella and Simon, thank you so much for your time today. Everything you've said makes perfect sense. Let's hope that some people's office relationships improve as a result. Now listen to part three again. Unit 38. Is exercise your idea of a nightmare? Do you think it's impossible to keep fit and enjoy yourself at the same time? I hope I can convince you otherwise. Get your inspiration from the physical activities that you already do and take pleasure from. There are things that are part of your regular, everyday life that are seriously good for you. For people with busy lives, it can be difficult to take the time out to go to a special place to exercise. You don't have to sacrifice any of that precious time at all. Think about making some minor adjustments to get your heart rate up while you go about your day. We all use the stairs, learn to love them, and never take the elevator. Challenge yourself to run up the stairs. Take them in double time. When you're driving, park a little way from your destination and walk the rest. Get off the bus or the train one stop early and do the same. If you love shopping, shop till you drop. It's good for you, if not for your wallet. If you're tied to the home most of the day, don't fear. How do you feel about dancing? Even if you're just rocking out in your kitchen, you're activating your muscles and enjoying the experience. Or have you tried rollerblading, cycling, or swimming? If you have an indoor pool nearby, swimming is a wonderful aerobic activity that can both relax you and burn off some calories. It's no impact, which protects your joints from damage, too. In good weather, cycling or rollerblading are a fun way to get out and about. Obviously, the extortionate fees charged by many gyms can put people off becoming members. Don't let that be your excuse not to exercise. Many high schools have tracks that anyone can use, and they're a perfect place to walk, jog, or run, alone or with company. City parks are also great spots to take a leisurely stroll. Maybe the all-American pastime of baseball is your favorite sport. Don't hang back there as a spectator. Sports are not just for the pros. Get together with some of your friends and neighbors and start some old-fashioned neighborhood ball games. The entire neighborhood can join you in your quest for improved fitness. You'll be doing them a favor. Physical activity is often more fun with other people. And who better than people you already know? You get to catch up with gossip, and they won't let you quit when you're low on motivation. Got some ideas now? Remember, when you find the right exercise for you... It'll be no pain and all gain. Have fun! Unit 39 Iceland wants investigative journalism to be free of unjustified interference by the rich and powerful. Although I thoroughly approve of the idea, 
The difficulty is that the rich and powerful also profit from freedom of expression by publishing material which is either a gross infringement of the human rights of an individual or misinforms the general public on important issues. Allowing international media organizations to say what they like, free from any accountability, creates a new form of totalitarian state. Iceland risks creating libel tourists, media corporations that want to profit without fear of correction or sanction at the expense of the individual. It's a great idea. If one European country revises its laws to meet high free speech standards, then others may do so too. Currently, plenty of countries in Europe restrict free speech, but using the internet, dissidents can speak freely to their supporters back home. From now on, if they publish from Iceland, opponents will find it difficult to close them down through expensive lawsuits, and critically, sources and contacts will remain hidden. There are other benefits too. This might even make our politicians take free speech more seriously. I wholeheartedly support Iceland's move, but will Iceland's proposed legislation make any difference in the long run? I doubt it. For every move on the chessboard of free speech, there's an equal and opposite move which negates openness. Access to Icelandic servers will be blocked by countries who are against the idea, leaving the technologically literate to use proxy servers to actually access the information. This is a fantastic and innovative proposal that will undoubtedly help certain news organisations and possibly individual journalists, but I honestly don't think, from the perspective of responsible news organisations, that it's going to make much difference. They will still be sued in their own countries under their own outmoded libel laws. Unit 39 Iceland wants investigative journalism to be free of unjustified interference by the rich and powerful. Although I thoroughly approve of the idea, the difficulty is that the rich and powerful also profit from freedom of expression by publishing material which is either a gross infringement of the human rights of an individual or misinforms the general public on important issues. Allowing international media organizations to say what they like, free from any accountability, creates a new form of totalitarian state. Iceland risks creating libel tourists, media corporations that want to profit without fear of correction or sanction at the expense of the individual. Unit 40. Speaker 1. When I left school 30 years ago, there was plenty of work. There was hardly any youth unemployment, but there were basically three work possibilities for 16-year-old girls like me. You could do shop work, go into the local textile factory or do admin in an office. I found work in the head office of a big insurance firm. It was a little on the dull side, but it was quite well paid and they trained me in general office skills and there was quite a pleasant working atmosphere there. Lots of banter, you know. I'm still in touch with quite a few people from the office. Obviously, at the time, I was still living with my parents, so I didn't need a great deal of money, and the work was quite varied. I spent most of my time on the phone dealing with customers' inquiries. I went on maternity leave and never went back. I thought about it when my children started school, but everything's changed now. The office where I worked has gone, and the work I used to do has moved to a call centre in India. Speaker 2 my dad retired last year. He'd been with the same company all his working life. He'd started with the company straight after leaving school and retired when he was 65. That's pretty unusual these days. I'm only just coming up to 30 and I've already been made redundant twice. The same goes for lots of my friends, so it doesn't bother me that much. You just accept it and get on with your life, don't you? But my dad's really shocked. People of his generation would have thought the world had ended if they'd lost their job at any age. I suppose it's more worrying if you find yourself out of work in your late 40s or your 50s. It's so much more difficult to find new employment at that age. At my age, as long as you're prepared to retrain, you know, pick up new skills, you're almost certain to find something. Having said that, I'm probably one of the lucky ones. I'm experienced and well qualified, and I don't really mind what kind of work I do. Speaker 3 my family has run this farm for as long as anyone can remember, at least eight generations. 
My father took it on from his father, who had taken it over from his father, my great grandfather. In those days, the 1920s, 20 men were employed here. Now there are just five of us my wife and I, our foreman, and two farmhands who've been with us for over 30 years. That's in addition to a lot of expensive tractors and other high tech gear, of course. I love farming, but I don't think my children will want to take over from me. You have to work all hours of the day, often seven days a week. I haven't had a proper holiday for five years. It's a very hard life. And it isn't as if there are great financial compensations. Margins are very tight today, largely because the supermarkets dictate the prices we get for our produce. Sometimes there's barely enough money to cover costs. Most kids these days think farming's a mugs game. Unit 41. Speaker 1. Obviously, it's not just the fuel situation that's worrying us. We know the whole economy's in a mess. One or two friends lost their jobs already and couldn't keep up their mortgage repayments and have had to move out of their homes. But I think what's hit my family the hardest in the last few years is the increase in the price of fuel of all kinds. You know, from running the family automobile to keeping the house heated during the winter months. I guess here in the States, we've never had to worry over much about the cost of gas. Now, all of a sudden, we're beginning to realize that it's not going to last forever. We're having to import oil from other places. That's one of the reasons prices are going up so fast. What this all means to us, as a family, is that we're having to generally keep a check on our spending. You know, using our car less. Going by bus or train if we can. Like, I don't drive to work anymore. Getting stuck in those early morning jams turned out real expensive. Speaker 2 for us, it has to be the cost of putting the kids through higher education. Here, people finance their college fees through debt these days, but loans are not as easy to come by as they were a few years ago. It's well known that college fees are going up at an alarming rate. I read an article the other week which said that in the near future, college education may become unaffordable to many American families. It's not just the fees, it's the accommodation, food, books. Both of our boys are at college. One graduates next year. Our youngest son, Jake, still has two years to go. They both do a few hours part-time work a week to help with their living costs. For the moment, we can afford it. But if the general economic situation goes on getting worse, who knows what may happen? Some of our friends are already getting jumpy and talking about taking their kids out of college. We're not quite at that stage yet, but if my husband or I got laid off, what then? We don't think it's very likely, but these are strange times. You get the feeling that with the economy in freefall, anything could happen. Unit 42 the importance of plants to our everyday lives cannot be overestimated. On a fundamental level, plants provide us with the basis of life. They take sunlight and carbon dioxide and turn them into oxygen, and in doing so provide us with the air we breathe. They also take water and slowly release it back into the atmosphere. In a more practical sense, most of us depend on plants for protection and shelter. Timber from trees is used to build many of our homes, and cotton plants supply us with the material from which we make our clothes. Throughout the world, much of our medicine is also based on plants. Over 5,000 species of plant, for example, are used in traditional Chinese medicine. Another example is the widely used drug aspirin, which originates from the willow tree. A cure for cancer, called Taxol, has been found in the bark of a yew tree. Aloe and jojoba plants provide us with many of the ingredients for cosmetics. The aloe plant soothes the skin, and the jojoba plant produces oil used in shampoos and soaps. Common food crops such as corn can also be used to make products such as soap, glue and plastics. And, of course, plants provide us with food. Both vegetarian and meat-eating diets are dependent on plants. Animals used in food production need food from grass, grains and vegetables too. As a result, the pressure on food supplies is huge. 
As populations increase, farmers are under increasing pressure to grow crops that are resistant to water shortages and have better and more frequent harvests. Finally, coal, gas and oil, which all come from the remains of plants and animals that lived many years ago, provide the energy we need to heat our homes, offices and factories, and to fuel our cars, etc. Without such energy sources as these, rapid industrialization in many countries wouldn't have been possible. Unit 42 the importance of plants to our everyday lives cannot be overestimated. On a fundamental level, plants provide us with the basis of life. They take sunlight and carbon dioxide and turn them into oxygen, and in doing so provide us with the air we breathe. They also take water and slowly release it back into the atmosphere. In a more practical sense, most of us depend on plants for protection and shelter. Timber from trees is used to build many of our homes, and cotton plants supply us with the material from which we make our clothes. Throughout the world, much of our medicine is also based on plants. Over 5,000 species of plant, for example, are used in traditional Chinese medicine. Another example is the widely used drug aspirin, which originates from the willow tree. A cure for cancer, called Taxol, has been found in the bark of a yew tree. Aloe and jojoba plants provide us with many of the ingredients for cosmetics. The aloe plant soothes the skin, and the jojoba plant produces oil used in shampoos and soaps. Common food crops such as corn can also be used to make products such as soap, glue and plastics. Unit 42. Exam Practice. Listening, part four. You will hear five short extracts in which people talk about aspects of the natural world. Look at task one. For questions one to five, choose from the list A to H, the person who is speaking. Now look at task two. For questions six to ten, choose from the list A to H, the idea that each speaker is expressing. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. Speaker 1. Here at the Millennium Seed Bank, we work with 50 partner countries. We collect seeds from alpine, coastal and island ecosystems, as these are most vulnerable to climate change. Plants from arid locations can tolerate being dried out and frozen for many years, but those from moist tropical areas are harder to store. Our initial aim was to store seeds from all the UK's native plants. We've now achieved this, apart from a few species that are either very rare or whose seeds are particularly difficult to store. What's even more remarkable is that we've achieved the goal of banking seeds from 10% of the world's flora. Our next target is to conserve 25% of the world's plant species by 2020. Speaker 2 Throughout the country, we have inherited a legacy of first-class public parks. Today, every town has a park to be proud of, and many are historically important. The Victorians invented and shaped the concept of public parks, and this influenced the creation of parks in America and elsewhere. Recognising the need for places to relax and to exercise, the top landscape designers of the day were commissioned to lay out new parks. My research clearly shows that the promoters and champions of the first public parks also saw them as a way of boosting the local economy by making towns attractive places to work and live. These parks were conceived as places where all sections of society could enter free of charge and mix freely. Speaker 3 We all need power and I believe micro-generation is the way forward. It's quiet and efficient and I expect to earn back what I pay out in a very short time because we're located on the windy coastal road. I farm beef cattle, and last year the electricity bill was £2,500. Next year, I'm hoping to pay nothing and make a profit by selling some back to the national grid. So, if we can save money and produce surplus energy, I'll be very happy. Don't forget, we've been harnessing wind power since the 12th century to mill grain and pump water. But now wind will play an even more important role as we face rising fuel costs and a growing population.
Speaker 4. All the animals that have arrived from the overnight emergency clinic or that were brought in early are examined first. If they need surgery or hospitalisation, they'll be admitted. The emergency doctor usually calls to discuss cases from the emergency clinic. This is followed by the morning rounds. All patients in the clinic are examined and the owners phoned with progress reports. At the same time, animals being admitted for surgery are examined and the procedure discussed with owners. After they are admitted, technicians take blood samples and then it's time for appointments or surgery. Personally, I like to do surgery early in the day as this allows patients to recover throughout the day while there are plenty of staff to monitor progress. Speaker 5 Here is what I'd suggest doing in the next week or so. Clip your hedges and prune your shrubs, cutting out dead, diseased branches. Plant shrubs and trees while the soil is still warm. Aerate lawns and remove moss and dead grass to encourage healthy growth next season. Incidentally, now is an ideal time to put down a new lawn. Next, check the readiness of fruit and vegetables. Apples and pears should be gently lifted with the hand. If the stalk remains on the fruit but parts easily from the tree, it is ready to be picked. Sweet corn should be ripe enough to harvest, but remember that it deteriorates quickly, so you should use it as soon as possible after picking. Now listen to part 4 again. Unit 43 in a world where we rely on being online and contactable anytime and anywhere, it is hard to imagine a time when letters were our only means of communication, a time when a letter was something special and meaningful both for the letter writer and for the person receiving it. Letter writing took time and concentration. For many, it was a tedious process, which involved lots of sheets of paper, lots of ink and rewrite upon rewrite, as without a delete button, you would have to start your letter all over again if you made a mistake. However, for others, such as myself, it was a rich form of expression, one where you could take your time and really think about what you wanted to say. You could go over your letter until it was perfect, and if you had a heart-rending message for a loved one, for example, you could make it as romantic, heartfelt, and soppy as you wanted. The advent of the telephone usurped letter writing, as it was so much more immediate. You could pick up the phone, talk to the person at the other end in real time, and get an immediate response. As the internet became more and more important, our ways of communication changed dramatically again. Although more and more people now own smartphones, they actually use them less to make calls. Faced with a proliferation of ways to communicate such as email, video conferencing, instant messaging, social networks and apps, conventional phone calls are becoming increasingly obsolete. In our age of instant communication, the opportunities to reach out are endless. You can keep in touch with distant relatives or friends in foreign countries and can share your special moments with them in a heartbeat. However, as letter writing has become rarer, if you do decide to take the time and make the effort to write one, chances are it will be very much appreciated. Unit 44 I'd like you to discuss some of the ways in which people try to protect the environment. Think and talk about the benefits of the different ways, and then decide which change to people's lifestyle would be most difficult to make. So, what about bikes to rent? You can hire bikes by the hour or the day in London, can't you? You collect them at one place at the beginning of your journey, and then leave them at another place near the end. They're trying to stop people using their cars. I think they're a great idea, and cycling helps people to keep fit. I agree they're a good idea, but it often rains in London, and there aren't many cycle lanes, so cyclists are involved in quite a few accidents. Mm. What about the idea of recycling plastic? Yes, people have picked up on this idea very quickly, haven't they? I know my family were very keen on it. It seems such an obvious thing to do. It does. Yes, we've always done it too. But I remember hearing on the news recently that we're recycling more plastic than our industries can reuse. 
So they're now exporting what we can't use to other countries. Seems crazy, doesn't it? It must cost a fortune to export. Yes, it must. What about energy from solar panels? Surely solar energy is the way forward. The sun's never going to stop shining. <laughs> well, it is, but not for millions of years. The real problem with panels is that they're expensive to install, so it takes years to save the initial cost of installation. I suppose you're right. But the energy itself is free, and it doesn't pollute the environment. True, but what about people who live in cloudy countries? As long as the sun shines for part of the time, it at least means people use less conventional fuel like electricity or gas. One of my favorite ideas is getting people to buy all their fresh fruit and vegetables from local shops. I'm sure we'd all be a lot healthier if we did. I agree. But sometimes fruit and vegetables are grown in other countries and are brought here by air. And planes are some of the worst air polluters. And not only that, the fruit and vegetables are more expensive because they've had to travel so far. You're right. The issue of so-called food miles is being taken much more seriously than it was a few years ago. We do always try to buy local produce if we can. That's also a good way of supporting local farmers. There's always the energy-saving light bulb. They're trying to ban the sale of traditional light bulbs because they're so wasteful of energy. But these new ones are much more expensive than the old ones. But they do last much longer, an average of seven years apparently. I know that, but they're not as bright as the old ones. I don't like them, I'm afraid. Mm. So which change do you think would be the most difficult for people to make? Unit 45. Speaker 1. In my opinion, the answer has to be electricity and electrification. I know electricity is more of a discovery than an invention, and also that we're not talking about a single event. Electricity is still being introduced in many parts of the world. For me, the reason it's so important is that without electricity, many of the other inventions people mention would not have been possible like radio and television, computers or the internet. Even many medical advances would have been far more difficult without the simple benefit of electric lighting. So much of modern life depends on electricity. Lighting, heating, food production, transport, health care, etc, etc. The list is endless. Nothing else even comes close. Speaker 2 so the real answer is that the product we just could not survive without, and that has allowed us to develop at a faster rate than if it hadn't been there, is, in my opinion, the discovery in 1928 of penicillin by Sir Alexander Fleming. This not only marked a period of great medical advance, it saved countless lives, including people who have gone on to contribute to our cultural evolution. Today, the average life expectancy of a human in the developed world is far greater than before we had antibiotics, and this increased lifespan allows us as individuals to contribute far more to the world. Speaker 3 The most important invention over the last 100 years must be the microchip. It just goes to show the incredible power of tiny things. Smaller than the smallest coin, the chip is quite literally the brain, heart, and nervous system of every digital device on the planet. It powers computers, mobile phones, washing machines, cars, and satellites. It is used in the design of space stations. It guides planes in for a safe landing. It makes it possible for us to watch hundreds of TV channels and enables teenagers every day to log on to the Internet and chat with somebody half a world away. Since the widespread introduction of the microchip in the early 1970s, there have been more scientific breakthroughs than in any other period of time, due in large part to the awesome computing power this thin silicon wafer has brought us.